front of us is the chassis just in the form that you, you, you would get it from us with the floor already temporarily fitted in. Now we are recommending that you do wash the chassis down well with cellulose thinners and um, then paint it with a bare metal primer. That's a good idea for the floor as well. However, you can go on and you can carry out the process that we're doing now and paint the body panels and the chassis all in one go, but it's entirely up to you. We're going to remove this section from the floor. This has been left in so that we could get more components in the kit while it's being transported. So with a pair of metal cutting shears, we're going to snip out this section. Now it's important that you keep this because this forms the top of the tunnel like so later on. If you're going to fit a fire speed as we're going to do, it'll mean you will have to cut off the front of this angle section. So just as I've marked it there, you'll cut all that off. That'll mean then that the, the gearbox mount for the fire speed will, will bolt there. If it's a four speed that you're fitting, then obviously it will fit on the bit that's left just there. The only part of the welding that is exposed on the finish 2B is the little bit where the backstay reaches the roll bar and we're just going to cosmetically tidy that up with a mini grinder. At the same time, where these two tubes join, we're going to tidy that up. We've got the chassis in the position now to accept the rear subframe. As I said previously, all we've done is just to wire brush it up and give it a coat of black primer. The bolts that go through the outside of the rear trailing arm need to be taken out and put in the opposite way around. And then you'll tap out the, the bolt so that the bolt is the end of the bolt is flush with the inside so there's nothing sticking out at all like so at this point remember if you've any damage to the gaiters or you feel inside and there's ball bearings loose or the split it's a good time to change these are very expensive to buy new and they're difficult to fit and they're not used on the 2B only for location purposes we've noted when we took it off that the actual metal tube in the driver's side had come adrift. You could see you could knock it through like that. Don't worry, just knock it through from the bottom so it sticks up like that. What we're going to do, in actual fact, is to trim those tubes off so there's round about half an inch sticking up through the rubber. So we're going to cut those off with a hacksaw or with an angle grinder. Also when you're grinding things, you may need just to relieve the pressing around that outer wishbone housing. There's a little web on it, you may just have to grind the web off. You could check all the rubber bushes at the same time. Probably with the provisional line up onto the chassis, uh, you'll uh, be able to establish this. There is a bracket here you need to grind off for the uh, exhaust that's no longer used. Later on in this video, we'll be drilling two holes in this subframe to firmly locate it into the chassis. There's two holes in the underside of the rear strengthening plates, which you will project through and drill into the subframe. These holes will be somewhere there. We have to find these holes in the metal floor, drilling through these holes from the top. So all I'm going to do is get my hammer now and twist that. indicates, I can see I've got a little, little indentation in it, that shows us where we're going to drill through from the top. That's where the handbrake will fit and there will be a strengthening angle that will go right the way across the car to give you extra strength. We're now going to move this subframe forward directly underneath the holes in the two strengthening plates. We've got it on a trolley jack so we're going to move it 
forward now, we're spying through these holes now, and we can see we're more or less level, ease it across there, a quarter of an inch, put some blocks of wood, we've conveniently found that these floor joists, these nine inch floor joists, will go on edge, and they fit underneath the point that we've just worked on, under those the bigger rubber mountings, it makes a subframe so it's level and we can press down on it. We're now removing the counter bump and that then brings the, the back of the box down naturally. We've now got the edge of the floor directly touching or almost touching that part of the subframe. We line it up so both sides are nearly there, press the floor down in the middle and then we're going to lift the chassis upwards and we're going to push the floor under those bits and we're putting it in from above. We're nicely spying down those holes and those cut off tubes coming through the hole like that so all I'm doing now is getting my bolt and I'm tapping it through like so nearly there just needs a little bit of persuasion right, okay that's it now what is important and that's gone through there. at this stage now we've got to get the diff mounting past the angle now it always does seem as if it's not going to go because it is very very tight so it just needs a little bit of a persuasion to get it in we're having difficulty in getting that casting past that piece of angle there so we've decided that we're going to take these bolts out at the side now like so and then we've got both out and now we think it may be a little bit easier to prise it. It's gone in. So that's good. That was all it needed. So what's going to happen now is we're going to put these bolts back in the side again. We're going to just press that down like that and we're going to mark just here around it, around it and project directly like that because we're now going to drill a hole in this about half an inch from the top that will put the bolt back in to retain that. So we're, we're projecting where it wants to be and we're drilling through from the, the back. You can just lift the chassis slightly and you'll be able to see the hole so you can put a, a line down in line with it. If you drill about a half an inch from the top and preferably if you use an eighth drill for a pilot hole, you can ensure that it's in the right place before you finally drill it out. You can see by moving the chassis up down, the hole is in line, so now I'll enlarge it. And then tighten it up. Okay. To put these bolts in the other way around so we're taking the bolt out like that and we're going again to put it back in it's a good idea just to keep those lined up using the studding that you get in your kit we're going to pull this together. So we pop the stud in through there, like so. Put a washer on the bottom and a knot. And then two of washers on top. That the tube will pull through. And then another washer on top of that, like so. We can tighten it all up. That's very important. That's very important. You may be able to use that somewhere for the uh, on the SVA test. And you need the bump stop, and you need virtually all of that. You don't need the spring, and you don't need the that cop at this stage. I don't think. But don't throw it away yet. The whole part of this exercise is at this stage. We do need that cup washer. 
to go back to a few minutes ago when we did the rear suspension and we put the rear subframe on, that cup washer needs to go underneath, underneath the big fat rubber mounting on the front of the subframe. So that goes round there, that way up like that. That just nestles in nicely. So when you pull up the rear suspension, then that is underneath. That is a cup I've referred to, and there it is underneath there like that, nicely onto the rubber. Now also, while I've got it held in there like this, we're going to drill a hole here, and that hole will come out there like that. It'll come through the bottom like that. Previously, I indicated that the strengthening plate, which is a plate that's underneath the floor panel, had a hole in it. If you remember, we planished the, the floor itself to find out where the hole was. We're now going to drill this hole, so we're going to drill through the floor, the drill will go through the existing hole in the strengthening plate, and then we'll reach the subframe. We'll drill through the top of the subframe, into a void, then out the bottom of the subframe, as I showed you with the white marker just a few minutes ago. That's through the top sheet, through the existing hole, and now we're into the top of the subframe. That's through the top of the subframe, into the void, and now we're going out the bottom. We now need to put a nut and bolt into that. The nut and bolt will be a 12mm, 40mm long bolt, but we do need to put it inside the void. So we don't want to be squashing the two parts of the subframe together, we want to put the nut or the bolt inside the void. So what it means is we've got to enlarge that hole that there is in the bottom. You'll see the hole has come through the bottom of the subframe there, and it's just come through the edge of that rubber mounting. Just there. so there's a hole just there. What we must do now is make that hole a little bit bigger on this bottom flange, so that we can actually get a bolt through it. So there's a 40 mil bolt, 12 mil, 40 by 12 mil bolt. You get in your kit. We need to make that hole a little bit bigger. We could get the drill and wobble the drill round in it, but I think what we'll do, we'll just get a chisel and just chisel the hole open a little bit. That's perfect. Right, cameraman, can you look inside this hole? Inside there, through the hole like that. Just tap it with a hammer a little bit. That's it. So that's gone up into the bowl, in, into the void. And now we're going to put the washer and the nut on the top. This bolt is key as it firmly secures the axle or the subframe to the chassis. And obviously it ties the two halves of the chassis together, incorporates this torque tube into the air construction. So we're now going to tighten that up. So we'll just get the 19mm spanner. Tight as I can. It's probably distorting the subframe plate and it's distorting the strengthening plate, but it's making a supersonic job of it. It's really bringing it up tight. Remember, this is something you could check annually before your MOT tests that this bolt is still tight. <coughs> That's great. So, obviously, we do the same on the other side. We can now take out this stud in, it's in there temporarily, and put a proper nut and bolt in. You could squirt a little bit of um, wax oil in inside there now, and then put a little plate over that, a couple of self tapping screws, seal it off with silicone sealer drill a hole for the water to get out of it and that's there for keeps. While the car is on its side like this it's good now to explain to you the next stage. You do need to put a few 6mm nuts and bolts around that plate there like that. So drill that with a quarter drill or a 6mm um, drill and bolt that together with 6mm um, bolts. You will need also to work out exactly where the centre line 
of the shape of the round tube is. So you see it's there and we can very roughly protract it, project it, and we see it's there like that. We also we can look and see that it goes down the middle of the car like that. You do need now to drill that with an eighth drill or a 3.2 drill, drill straight through the floor and into the tube and put self-tapping screws into the tube to fix the floor. So that you're going to put those in evenly spaced along both sides and down across the middle main tube. In addition, there will be a, an, a strengthening angle that goes across the bottom of the car that picks up on the handbrake mounting. We now come to look at a partly built car, another 2B that's in the process of being built, and you can see the rear suspension set up there. The existing Ford Sierra rear spring in the wishbone, and you can see that it's housed in that, which is actually your front McPherson strut upside down and we've put a slit into the bottom of the rollover bar and we've pushed that McPherson strut up into the roll bar like so. We're interested as I just said in the, this part of it here that um, we're going to use as a rear spring seat. It is convenient because it means that depending on the springs that you've got in your Ford Sierra depending on whether they're old or tired or new or soft or hard or upgraded. Um, it means that you can move this um, spring seat up and down in that tube to compensate for it. It also means you can adjust the ride height. So we're now going to take, we're going to cut this unit up now initially to get that part of the strut housing that we need. I'm going to go on to tell you now that we do need this chrome shaft because the chrome shaft from the first and strut is utilised in the front suspension. It is the, it, that is the pillar that the stub axle slides up and down on. I will tell you now that you must take that spring off. Don't try to do this exercise with the spring on. The spring must be removed. Um, and also, there isn't any danger to you because there isn't any pressure in this unit. This unit is, is not, unless that piston was pressed down, um, then there wouldn't be any pressure. So we're going to now make sure that we've got the chrome shaft pulled right out of the unit as out, out as far as it can and what we're actually going to do we're going to cut off the end of the unit like that bit of a messy job because there's oil inside it so make sure you've got something on the floor to catch the oil and I'm going to cut it off with an angle grinder just for speed I've cut it as close to the bottom as possible so it's possible now to gently knock out the chrome shaft through the bottom. Like so there is a tube comes out with it. I haven't yet found a use for that tube, but that's throw it away because it's a nice piece of tube. So that comes out like that, and that's the bit that we want. That is the key bit. Remember these boxes of surgical gloves only cost five pounds it's a good idea to wear those when you're doing something like this because for all we know this oil is cancer forming or cancer aiding so you didn't really ought to get it on your hands so there's that tube no use for it yet but let's save it it's a nice piece of tube might do for your next kit car that you build and there's the key thing that we want this shaft and all this to date has been pretty straightforward, and I hope you're managing to follow it easy. There's just one slight little snag. These McPherson struts, or this McPherson strut that we've got here, without any doubt, is the same unit as was fitted to the car when it left Dagenham, Cologne, or wherever it came from. And the unit, that, that unit, is perfect for the 2B. If, however, your Ford Sierra has been fitted with replacement, non-genuine McPherson struts, bogey ones, Armstrong ones, then you could encounter a problem. We've
found a car recently that had got new ones fitted. It was obviously they were non-genuine because of the good condition it was in. They've got blue paint on them, and this seat was in fact different, which didn't cause a problem. But the thickness of the body was a lot thicker, or it was a couple of mil thicker, that meant that it couldn't easily fit inside our tube. It isn't impossible that you can use non-genuine ones, but if it is a genuine unit, it's a lot easier to use. To get back to this again now, we'll knock off that bottom, and we need now to cut this off, again in the vice with a hacksaw, round right around there, like that, nice and square, and deburr it, and then the other end, you could do as leaving as long as possible so you've got the maximum adjustment. However, the size of tube isn't perfect and it is a bit of a tight fit inside our roll bar tube. So what it really means that um, you've got to get your soft disc grinder and clean all this up really well, all the rust off it, so as it will slide up and down the tube easily. That is going to go inside that tube and slide up and down to give the adjustment you need. So at a guess, I think you could probably take about three inches off that. You will need to slit this tube with a mini grinder or angle grinder. You'll need to put a slit in it just to help it a little bit so that that goes inside easier. Um, and then that will slide up and down. You can put, you can drill it and put a peg in it temporarily uh, to rest on so you can get, you can, before you adjust to the right height, and then when you finally have adjusted the right height, then you can nut and bolt it right the way through. Due to us being constantly asked for a wishbone front suspension system, we have introduced a plus pack, which many of you have ordered with your kit. Obviously, some of the material on this video is not applicable to you, as is the information regarding the use of the rear suspension system for those of you who have our coil overs. Both these areas will be covered later on in the video. You will know yourself which suspension system you've got at the front. We're now going to carry on with the back suspension of the car. You'll see now that we've put both these um, main fixing bolts into the subframe and through the strengthening plates and through the floor. And we've taken out the temporary studding that was in the, uh, the rubber bush tube. Now you'll see that's pushed that tube up through the strengthening plate and there's a material sticking up through the top. We're going to grind that off flush now. And now, with that same big cut washer from the top of the front suspension and with the original bolt, we're now going to put that back through the bottom like so. And then we've just got one of the front compliance bush washers. That's the washer that goes through the front lower track control arm on your Ford Sierra, a substantial washer. We're putting that on there like that. And now we're going to bolt that up solid. Um, to give it quite a additional secure fix in. So that goes on there like that. And then that's wound up quite tight. I'm going to cut both those two lots of studs off because quite simply we need to get that area as level as possible so that we can get the seat in and the seat needs to sit as low as possible. So we'll flush that off again with the angle grinder. I'm using the big one for speed but you can do it with this four inch grinder. We now come to fit the springs and the spring seats. I've cut these McPherson struts down now, five inches just there and two inches just there. Note that there is a special shape so it accepts the spring, the springs aren't ground springs, they're just naturally wound springs so there is quite a step there and that step does go into the spring like that. So when you come to fit these, there is also a step in the lower cup of the lower wishbone. You must note 
where the two steps are. One's at six o'clock and one's at three o'clock. When the lower step in the spring sits in the cup, then the top step in this must correspondingly be in the correct position. So when you put these into the end of the roll bar, then they've got to be um, associated with each other. If we look now at the bottom of the roll bar, I've already put a cut in that roll bar with the angle grinder. So it starts from the bottom of that shock absorber bracket and it's cut right down to the bottom. If we can look into the cup, so you can see the step in the lower cup that I'm referring to just there, so the spring will only sit in one position in the cup like so, like that. Which means that the top step is directly to the inside of the car. So when we come to put this on, that step just there must correspond with that. Uh, I'm going to put this cap on top of there like that so it lines up. I'm then bringing that in line with that and I can see that that is got to go on just there. So we just dispense the string for a second and we tap this. From the last car that we did, the yellow car, we can see that it has to be about an inch from that um, shoulder to the start of the tube. So that is a rough indication of how it needs to be. Obviously what will happen is that we'll, we'll put something temporary on there like a pair of vice grips to stop it slipping and we'll put the weight of the car down, put the wheels on it and then we'll be able to make adjustments to that and pretty definite for the first couple of hundred miles you'll be adjusting this quite a lot to get it exactly as you like it. Cool. Right, we've now taken the axle stands out, put two wheels on, still on the jack and we're now going to lower the car down gently onto the ground at the same time locating the springs in the spring seats. Turn around. Don't get your fingers trapped when you do this. Obviously, you can do with an operator letting the jack down while another operator locates the springs. Right, that's now seated onto there. And we haven't put anything to stop these slipping up the tubes because they're quite tight. Um, normally you'd put some 
via strips there just temporarily. But you can see that we've got a really nice action there. I can do this all day long. Really nice action and the suspension's working quite well. So I can see already that we do need to be taking those um, seats further down the tubes, a little bit low, but for the exercise now, uh, that's okay. Just in case you're wondering, um, the original shock absorbers are used, I'll cover this later on, the original shock absorbers are used and they go on to this bracket or part of this bracket that's up here and um, the shock absorbers do then restrict the movement of the wishbone so the springs don't fall out. This car that you're looking at now has got the coil over shock absorbers fitted, the type that you would get in our new kit. You can see that it's a unit that has the comes complete with the two nuts on, one locking nut, and it has the coil on it and the top washer. With it comes the the top bracket that goes into the roll bar and you'll see the bottom bracket that bolts into the existing hole that's already in your lower spring seat cup on the saloon and hatchback wishbones. Pretty straightforward, it all lines up quite well. If it isn't quite straight then obviously there's provision to move that bottom saddle in the, um, in the cup. The most important thing is that the, the two bolts um, that go through the top and through the bottom, it's a 10mm in the top and a 12mm in the bottom, that those are both on the same plane and they're both on the same plane as the axles of the car, that is going straight the way across, that's important. As we look at this, you can see that that's been trimmed off, remember you've got to trim off this rollover bar, this has been trimmed off as far as we can, as close to the top as you can get in with your angle grinder or hacksaw, and then we provisionally put it on that first hole there, we've bolted through with a nut and bolt, but we've made provision for another one if we want to adjust it later on, um, so we've drilled another hole in there. So it's a good idea to drill two or three holes in that tube and obviously you can still drill two or three holes in the inner tube. And then that nut and bolt that's gone through there, that 10mm nut and bolt, it's been pulled up quite tight. I can see that it's squashed <coughs> the tube slightly because it is quite a loose fit in there. This is an axle, as you can see, taken straight out of a donor vehicle. Um, now, on the the last um, coil over um, pictures that you saw, we'd actually cut this bottom this bottom bracket off the subframe uh, just for simplicity to make it look neater. But there is the bracket that takes a shock absorber, as in the donor vehicle. This is a shock absorber from the donor vehicle, and all that happens is this is bolted into that bracket through there naturally, and it is on a, a rubber, a very big rubber bush at the bottom, so it is quite forgiving. But that goes in there like that. And in this case, the orientation of the system, it doesn't matter, it allows for it. Now, if you've got the basic kit, then, and you had, didn't get our shock absorbers, then, as we've just said a couple of minutes ago, you're going to fit the original shock absorbers. These are the brackets that you get um, in the kit. They've already been drilled, they've already been bent, um, one hole's been drilled at least. So what happens is that you get the shock absorber like so and that goes that goes through that like that that goes on there and then we have to project the hole through there and we drill a hole in that bracket that then goes on to there like that and then once you've got that all together then you'll see that that bracket then bolts onto that part of the chassis side like that to, to pick up the top of the shock absorber with one bolt through there like that and then another bolt through the hole there and through the second bracket and then through there with two substantial bolts holding that together like that and the shock absorber goes on the top there and down at the bottom and this system works really really well obviously check your shock absorbers before you put them in to make sure they're in good condition while we're here on the back of this car 
there are a couple of bits I want to show you, quite interesting points. So if the cameraman just gets square on at the back of the car, then I can point them out to you now. In this car we fitted our own petrol tank instead of the donor vehicles and therefore we've put a plate in here to blank off this hole in the back panel. So there's been a plate put on there, these screws will, all, all, will obviously be cut off later on. The other thing is that you'll see that the way this has been done, that we've terminated um, our brake pipe just here. Now what actually you can see here we've got the T-piece, the end of the brake pipe that comes from the front of the car and then we've got two small pipes that go to the flexes on both sides. In actual fact what was intended to be done is that that T-piece would go here, either on the chassis or onto that panel and then the, the offside flexi would go into the T-piece just there. So the pipe from the front of the car that you get in the kit is long enough to reach the T-piece just there. So into the back of the T-piece goes the, 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 the rear pipe, into that side goes the flexi directly into the T-piece and then the Ford Sierra's own uh, brake pipe is used that goes from the T-piece to that side, from that side across to this side um, to the flexi. So there's two or three systems you can use. Uh, on this car as you can see we've elected to put all new brake pipes in as you possibly will yourself. Again, again on this car there are several things that are slightly different. We, we do give the people that build these cars for us the opportunity to experiment and do things their own way. I don't always agree with it but in this case our large tank is fitted and they've chosen to put a piece of timber on the back panel um, which is held in with a couple of small brackets off the tube and then onto the timber they've put the straps on that hold the tank in position. That's okay. Uh, the main reason I'm drawing your attention to the rear of the car is to start with they have got the later type filler neck that is a little bit more difficult to use and they've chosen to use a piece of plastic convoluted hose there that I believe is from uh, the heater or from the demisting system and that conveniently goes in quite well into the original tank gasket that you're using from the original tank and they've arrow dieted it in place which is correct whatever you use don't use silicone sealer because that is just break down in petrol or most of it does unless it's proper petrol resistant material so that works quite well a nice flow on that you can see that they've used, which is important, grommets where the wires come through. They've used those small domestic type connections that I'm not that keen on, but they do seem to be okay in this case. And then as we look across to the sender side of things, you can see they've ni nicely cut our cork gasket to make a gasket to hold the, the sender in. And they've got the sender held in nicely with the four washers and the four nuts and they've got the feed and return pipes to it again that's worked quite well remember when you put these senders in you've got to get the float to be moving up and down in the middle of the tank and not rubbing against the wall this is an estate axle um, the main difference being that this rear trailing arm is different there's this big lump just here and there's no provision for the the shock absorbers um, to be on the outside. They do come in the middle of the spring. So basically if you're going to use an estate axle, if you use, if you bought the more expensive kit with our coilovers then you can still use this. All you need to do is to knock off those two um, captivated nuts on there and put a plate, bolt a plate in the bottom that's going to take your, your saddle for the lower fixing. That's straightforward. If you want, if you bought the lesser kit, the cheaper kit, then you are going to have to rig something up on here to pick up your shock absorbers and there's no reason that you can't use the same system as on the estate. I initially thought the springs were too stiff but we've got people telling us they're perfect for competition use so it may be that you can use, a comp you can use the estate springs and shock absorbers just the same way as they came off the donor vehicle and you can fit them in the end of the rollover bar. If anybody's got any problems using the estate axle we have got information sheet that's available for you by request. To fit the rear panel, you can see that it's a flat panel, it's a dead flat panel. Make sure that when you come to work on it that you form it the correct way around. 
So we're going to turn it round the other way so that the filler cap, when you stand behind the car, is on the drive on the passenger side. So we turn the panel around like that and we lay it flat like that. We're now going to form it, and it's very easy. I know on this video this will look easy, and you'll say, I'm sure it's not as easy as that, but it really is easy. So you need very, very few simple tools. You've got a nice piece of plywood here, kind of thing you've got stuck there behind your shed. Make sure there aren't any nails in it. And we're laying that on top of the panel like that. And we're lining it up with the bottom. That's the two straight edges just there. That straight edge there. And that straight edge there. We're lining it up with that so it's level at the bottom. And we're going to just get our fingers under the middle bit like that. Fingers under the middle bit. And then we're going to kneel on it like that. I'm going to bend that up, like so, at 90 degrees. You won't get a very sharp corner, but in actual fact we don't want a sharp corner. And then we're going to get the other bit like that. Fingers underneath it, and bend it up like so. Fingers under that, and bend it up like so. You'll find if you've got a stainless steel car, it's a little bit tougher, but it's still pretty easy. There's two little bits where the rear number plate bracket or spare wheel hoop goes. They need a bit of help. So with a block of wood, tap those like that. Lift it up and then just straight that ed at that edge so it's straight again, and that's the bottom fold. We then go to the sheet again and we find. the middle of the sheet. Now, we'll measure it and find the exact middle, which is there. We measure out from the middle 20 inches. That way, and 20 inches that way. And then we put a mark. And in actual fact, there is a little mark there already I'm cheating, I know it's there, it's from the profile cutting. A little mark there, and a little mark just there, and that is the 20 inches. So those two marks should be 40 inches apart. We're now going to project that mark up here. So again from the middle, we're measuring out 20 inches, we're marking it, and we're marking it there. In this case, um, I'll cheat, so I happen to know that this board is square, and I'll put it on that mark, like so, and I'll draw, I'll draw a dotted line, like that, and we'll do it the same inside. dotted line there and that will be the apex of the curve of the body. Now again 
We have two more secret marks just there. You'll see a little bite out of it. And that is going to be another fold line which will go up and it will come in line with the, that cut just there. So that's the inside of that bite out just there. And the same the other side, we find that little secret mark. I'm just going to measure and tape and I'll tell you what it is. Yes, it's four and a half from the end. So it's four and a half from both ends. So what happens now is that, and then again we've got the, this dotted line, which is 40 inches apart, like that. And that just happens to correspond with the apex of that corner there. And the apex of that corner, when we measure that like that, we find that that is 40 inches thereabouts. So now, I keep remembering to put the top on your pen if you don't, they dry off. Okay. So, we now take this board again, and we put it on there like that, on those two white marks, like so, up to the marks like that, kneel on the board, get hold of the edge of the sheet, and just bend it over like that. Straight over, as far as it'll go. Same the other end. Like so. And we bend that over. Like that. And the next stage is that we dispose of the board. Make sure what you, you're using, the, the base you're using to work on, is dead flat and there aren't anything, there isn't anything on there like a pebble or a nut or a button off your shirt because you've been kneeling on this panel like this and you could damage it quite easily. So you're kneeling on this panel, square on like that and the dotted line is the apex of the curve of the back panel. So you're going to get hold of that and just bring it towards you very simply like that. And you're keeping your eye on that dotted line to make sure on this bend that you bend in this that that dotted line is in the center. Imagine that in there you've got a grapefruit or a small football and it's in the shape of that. You're doing it, you don't want it like a threatening bit, you want to get it nice and round and you're bending it like that and you're just easing it carefully like that and you're letting it spring back so it's naturally at 90 degrees with a nice rounded bend not like a threatening bit do the same the other end, just keep your eye on it like that press, push, press, push keep looking at it, don't take your eye off it springs back there and that is your rear panel formed. Obviously, we do this for you, it's so easy to do, but you'd imagine that by the time you get it home, it will be all be bent and the dog will have jumped on it and all kinds of things. So, it's a lot easier for you to transport. So there's your back panel there, an impressive piece of kit, ready now to go on to your car. And we have got the filler at the right side. So, if you can point towards the car now, just to recap that we've ground up that back, remember we did this earlier, so there's no lumps of weld sticking out there. And we're running our hands over it to make sure there's no weld splatter on it at all. There's no weld splatter, that's good. And we're ready now to fit the panel. Now what you need, you need some little clamps. We've just got these clamps, called Crank Twist clamps, made in America. Not expensive, nice little clamps. Or you could use G-cramps, you've got loads of those in your shed, G-cramps, or borrow them off your granddaddy's, always got G-cramps. Right. right, we're now come to fit the panel. So we've got the panel now, and obviously 
the cutouts in the bottom go around the spare wheel carrier. That goes on there like that. Those bits go underneath like so. Like that. Push them on. And very gently push it in like that. And we can see that it's pressing nicely against the back. So that's looking good and that's close to the tube just there. So we'll get the clamps now and we'll have a little bit of wood I think just to protect the, uh, the metal so as not to damage the metal. So underneath here we'll put a piece of wood in there. We've got the panel in position now, it's held on by a couple of G-clamps, two bits of wood and it's pressed against the tube. We've got the panel pretty flat onto the, uh, the lower tube. What is most important is that that hole just misses the down stay from the roll bar. The tank is a very tight fit as you probably appreciate, so that must be pretty close to that. So if you put your finger through you can see we're about a quarter inch off that tube. So don't have the tube encroaching through the hole. We've got to make sure it's straight along the bottom. So we're going to put that straight edge, I'm using a spirit level, along the bottom and then we can see that there's a indulation in the bottom panel. So with these new magic clamps I've got, I'm putting that on there and just wind it up gently and that will just push the panel in. Like so. Put the other one on the other side. We're now going to put some self-tapping screws into the panel at the bottom, into the tube. Okay. Can you see? Mm. When you're drilling these holes through the sheet metal into the tube, remember it's a little bit difficult because of, because of the round tube. You've always got to make sure that you're on the apex of the tube or else your drill will wander. Remember that you should be wearing goggles when you're drilling, particularly when you're drilling low down like this, because the drillings will fall downwards into your eyes, so just be very careful. Nothing's more annoying when you're building a kit car to have to spend hours at the eye infirmary having bits of metal taken out your eyes. It's a real waste of time. Okay, that's the panel fixed provisionally. Bottom. We now move towards the top. Remember, those of you who are building mild steel cars, as this is, that you do get a chance if you make a mistake, you can always fill and weld it. But if you build a stainless car, I'm afraid that you don't get a chance, that's it. You put a dent in it and it's in. So just be careful. Stop. Okay. 
Using a block of wood, we're going to press the panel to the top like that. Again, with these clamps, clamping it on. You really can't have too many clamps. These old fashioned G cramps do seem to feel better. These are record ones, they weren't that expensive. So I think they're trying to make a bit of a comeback after all the Taiwanese imports. So we're now going to tap over the top of the body. Now you should really use a, a wooden mallet for this or a hide mallet, but I'm going to use what you've probably got, an ordinary ball paint hammer. So on the very end, When you've got a section folded around like that, then get with the addition to some vice grips to just to grip it down finally, then we can then drill a hole. straight bit of the top panel, the back panel, fasten it down like that and screwing it all the way along. We've now done the easy bit along the back, the straight bit. We now come to the more difficult corners. It's important that you get the metal as close to the tube as possible. So the way we've bent it, it's quite good. We're going to now push it forward like that so that the gap there is closed. So it's pretty good, that's pretty close. So I'll put the clamp just here. This time without wood, I'm a little bit desperate. Be very careful, it's right on the apex, that should be all right, it shouldn't mark it. So we're gonna put that there like that. Not ever so tight, we're nearly up on the corner and we're gonna just try to just push it that little bit and it is it's moving on that clamp that's good so with a little block of wood and with the old trusty G cramp we put that there and we're going to just pinch that little bit we need on the corner to get it up tight so we've got that push close in that corner another block of wood there tighten it up again and we're pushing the metal forward taking all the gaps up and when we've got it all pushed forward and we're finally going to tighten this clamp. Like so, that's tight, that's nipped that. And then, as we did it before, we're going to tap back first. Over like that, 
that. And then the side. Just so it doesn't move, it doesn't spring back. Put a couple of screws in. Right, that secured that. Take off the clamps. And we're now going to form the corner. Now, we've got a slight problem in so much that, truthfully, there is too much metal on this corner to form over, or the skill that, um, that you've got to form it over. So we're going to cheat a little bit. We're going to trim it off. We're going to remove some of the metal from the corner so that we're not going to be forming over so much metal. So with a pair of cutting shears, we're going to trim away the corner. And we're aiming really at just having about three-eighths of an inch of material. above the top of the tube. We're cutting a semicircle out. Like so. But that's going to make it a lot easier to form over. a little bit too much on the corners so we'll just take a little bit more off again obviously you're a little bit limited how much you can take off because of the fact that you will eventually have to put some kind of finisher on the top and the further down you go then the more difficult it will be to cover up where you've come from. That's coming quite reasonable.
We've already drained the tank of petrol several days ago. It's very difficult to get all the fumes out of the tank. So what we've done now is we've actually connected the tank up onto the end of the exhaust part of this van. In this tank of petrol a few days ago, but it's very difficult to get all the dangerous fumes out of the tank. So just to make sure everything's safe, we're now going to start the van up and run it for a few minutes, or for about 20 minutes to be precise, so that, so that it'll completely degas it and get all the explosive fumes out of the tank. This is the exhaust pipe in the petrol tank. The next stage now is we're going to move on to the fuel tank, the petrol tank that we degassed earlier. I'd like to say that um, we've degassed it for safety. I don't feel that that system we've used is sufficient enough to start welding the tank or anything like that, but it, it does help you a little bit in case a spark should fly into the tank or anything like that while you're grinding. But in, in any event, um, try to keep the hole in the tank covered up. Um, and don't expose yourself to any unnecessary risks. Okay. I'm now holding a Ford Sierra petrol tank neck. You will note that the filling hole is at an angle to the neck. This is not a sapphire type or a very late Sierra one which is different so if you've got a very late vehicle then you can't use it it is different you need one the same as this now I've already cut this into three you can see there's two cut marks on it so just look at this and you must cut yours the same so put it in the vise and cut it and then disregard that bit there with that part disregarded then you will deburr it and you'll then turn that around like that and put that into there like that. I've had this together before and I've put a white dotted line where I need to put it into. So that goes into there like that. And that pushes in there like that. You see there's quite a bit of movement there, but it does fit quite snug. Now that is your new filler neck for, the, for your Robin Hood 2B. Now obviously we've still got to seal that around there. Um, that is something that can be sealed with a petrol resistant adhesive. You could even um, with care melt some of the original plastic into that to seal it or you could use a hermotype type sealer or an epoxy resin okay. an epoxy, epoxy resin aerodite type sealer so that is the new neck we'll also use the fixing hole Right, so this is a Ford Sierra tank without any modifications to it at all. Uh, fortunately, the previous owner's put a new sender in it, which is a good idea. Um, we've cut off that um, tube there that went to the neck as an overflow, so that'll have to be blocked off. So the tank just slides in like that, with the hole to the back, sits on top of the chassis, and that goes like that into that corner. You will have to remember not to dim the back panel and that bit encroaches just there. Now I'm just going to put the neck in temporarily. Okay. So the neck now goes in like so and through the hole in the side. Okay. size is only to locate the tank we still need that rubber gasket 
that seal that goes around that, and there's still some movement in that for adjustment. Remember that, um, as I said, not to dint the back panel, and it's a good idea to put a large sheet of plywood on the back panel, um, quite a substantial piece, round about um, half inch thick or three eighths thick, because you're going to fasten the spare wheel threaded rod to that. The reason we put the tank in now is because we're moving rapidly towards a seat back panel and the seat back panel is, has a hole in it for this part of the tank to stick through. So once you've got the seat back panel in, then you can then fix the tank in permanently with brackets etc. There is an alternative to the Ford Sierra petrol tank that you've seen on the earlier videos. That is one of the two tanks that's available as an extra from Robin Hood Engineering. Both tanks are made from stainless steel and both are easy to fit and both give you an awful lot more room in your uh, luggage space. Basically the standard tank fits in quite easily and uh, the larger tank is a little bit more difficult to fit. So I'll just start off by showing you how to fit the smaller tank. This can be fitted simply by threading it through the roll bar aperture and then it goes down and it fits against the two down tubes and um, on top of the uh, rear tube that goes backwards for the spare wheel. We move it to one side so that it gives you room this side to put a spare gallon can of fuel or possibly your tool kit. And then the filler neck goes through the hole there and into the tank. You put the original Ford Sierra filler neck goes through this hole and you will have to adapt it to fit into the tank. Obviously the rubber gasket that you receive the neck pushes into that. You'll find that um, there are two different types from the early and the late Ford series um, and they're both different and you will have to adapt them to fit. That was a medium capacity tank. This is a large capacity tank that's a little bit more difficult to fit and to thread in. Obviously you'll have to take uh, the wheel off and the suspension uh, shock absorber and the spring so that you can thread it in through here like this. So you'll see it goes through the hole up like that and then in tank head like that. Be careful that you don't dent the side panels with the core of the tank. It is a tight fit, so make sure you don't put dents in the side, and that pushes down like so, and again, the filler neck is in the same position like that. With regards to the other end, where you sell studs welded on the tank, you're given a cork gasket that you've got to cut to put in between the sender and the tank, and then it's just screwed down with these large washers to hold in place Good idea, some red hermitite on the gasket so it doesn't leak. You'll then need to cover the, 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 the floor with plywood and box it all in to stop the weather getting up. This is a seat back panel in the form that you'll get it flat. You need to form this and it really isn't difficult. First of all, you need to mark two inches either side of the of the centre incision. There is little bites in it anyway, but if not, mark it at two inches like that. You need to mark three inches up the side 
like so, just there and there. We need to form this now and again we'll do this by hand and we'll start off by bending up those centre tags like that. We're then going to foot fold the sides. So at that point there, not where the cup terminates, but just there, we're going to just bend that with the hands from that cup there to the cross at just under 90 degrees. like that. A kind of casual bend. Then from the incision there to that three inch mark again we'll bend that like that. The point in the middle where we've marked the two inches we'll use a little bit of timber just to help us with that. So we'll put the timber there like that and we'll kneel on it and we'll just bend that up at just under 90 and the same the other side the 90 and we'll come to this side again and at that point there and there we'll bend it bend it there three inch put mark like that right that is now ready to go into the car. I forgot to tell you, just to make sure that that mark just there, that bite, that three quarter inch bite, is at the driver's side. Don't get it wrong because that's where the tank comes through. So we're now going to offer this panel up to the car, handle it carefully because it is a bit wobbly. That goes in there like that and we're going to get it as central as we can. You'll see that that step down there is level with the top of the roll bar centre section and we're going to just bend that flap a little bit more just there to allow it to be central that's it, let's move it across a little bit and we're looking now To still move it another quarter an inch. It's not bad at that. And we do need that top of that step to be level with the square bar. Now we're going to get a piece of timber and a couple of G cramps. I 
we're going to crap that in position. Right, provisionally clamp this and you'll see that that steps level with the top of that almost and that's pretty flush with the end of that and flush with the end of that. So we're now going to tighten up these clamps and you'll see that's going to start to press the panel to that square section bar. And you see it's forming into position and it's actually forcing it in like that. Now, that's just to it down a little bit there. We're now going to supplement this with some more clamps. Cut. And finally, tighten all the clamps up quite tight. And what we're going to do now is just tap that protruding three quarter of an inch over the square bar. But first we're going to put two self-tapping screws in, just to 100% fix it so it doesn't move when we tap it. We're now, going to, we're now going to tap over this top clip using a block of wood to make a neater job. We're now going to put a few self-tapping screws in that back rail. Right, we now put the last self-tapping screw in. We can now take the clamps off and take the timber off. Finish that off neatly, just tap that really neat. Right, we're now coming to the rest of the panel, and it really is just a matter of gently just pushing it.
can see that it wants a little bit trimming off there just to make it fit better. And this side is quite good, that will go in quite well. Okay, I'll just trim that a little bit just there. Trim a little bit off that piece just there. <coughs> You'll notice that when I trim small pieces like that, it may seem ever so easy, but I have got a choice of left and right hand shears. That's quite important. Okay, we're now going to try to ease this in position now. Still needs a little bit more of it, I'm afraid. That's it. Now you'll notice that that flap is above the other section. You put that in like that and it's just catching in behind that knot just there. We'll do the same the other side. Press that in gently like that and that likewise with the little bit of trimming off it side just there. stay there like that. So basically apart from bending these two tags over like so, pressing that like that, and that like that, that is the seat back, back panel provisionally fitted. We will have to take it out again because the tank isn't in for keeps. So we can move the tank like that and that fills that aperture quite well. So we've obviously still got to fit the tunnel, we've got to fasten it down at the bottom, but that is it fitted provisionally. We'll, we won't do any more to it now because we will take it out again for the next stage, but you can see that's quite clean, quite precise and um, quite neat. This is the position the tank will finish up in. We've still got to put some P-clip brackets off that tube there to hold the tank just there. We'll have a L-shaped bracket off the side just there. Off where? Off the side just there onto the tank. We, you'll see that once you've got a cover on here there will be a little bit of room on top of the tank um, but also there's quite a lot of room at the side but you will have to make a floor in here yourself, preferably out of plywood, that will ledge on the tank and sit on the um, rear spring top. And that will give you quite a bit of room just there. Obviously into the future, towards the end of 1999, we will be offering tanks, um, Robin Hood tanks, at a smaller capacity, but will give you a lot more boot space. Just take the engine mounting, put it into the frame loosely, just fit it in, put the nut on, tighten the nut so far up to allow the mounting just to be able to move on its seat. So that when we put the engine in, we've got some movement 
with some allowances. Engine mounting, later engine mounting, and this is the actual casting mounting. These are aluminium. The early ones are cast iron. So these are the type that should be used with these mountings. As you can see, by now we've got the back axle in, so I've now chopped the back axle so it won't move either way. And I've mounted the front approximately six inches from the floor. Uh, if you have the engine as slow as possible, the chassis as low as possible at the front, it will make the access for the engine easier as it goes in. If you're in Jack. I've got the engine on the hoist inclined at an angle, as you can see, uh, so that the back end will enter more easily, and then we can lower the front end down to the mountains. Before you fit the engine, you find it more helpful if you remove as many of the accessories as possible, uh, especially the fan. Uh, the fan is secured with a single nut at the front. We made a special tool to take them off, but if you refer to your Haynes manual, it will give you instructions how to do it. The nut is actually a left-hand thread, so you must remember that when you're trying to remove it. The only other way, if you don't have a fan is to possibly have a screwdriver or a punch and preferably while the thumb is still on you can get onto the edge of the nut and you can tap the nut to get it to turn once it turns it usually come off very simply by turning round until it removes as you can see if you look there's a single nut there and it is a left hand thread. Before you fit the engine, it's a good thing to drain the oil out because otherwise you'll have oil dripping out as you're fitting it. Unfortunately, these engines don't have a drain plug, so it's not so easy to drain them. One way is to take the side plug out and tilt it on its side and drain it that way. Uh, but in either case, however you do it, make sure that the engine, the gearbox is drained and the plug is loose so that when you come to top it up, you haven't got any problems. It may be a good thing to actually leave the plug out, and then this will remind you that you haven't actually filled it with oil. Um, another point to bear in mind when you're fitting it is that the speedo cable is rather difficult to reconnect once you've put the uh, prop shaft tunnel in. So it's a good thing once we've got the engine in to actually fit the cable and fit the circlet in and then curl it out, down out of the way so that you can put the floor in. But it is difficult to connect once you've put the prop shaft tunnel in. At this point it's a good idea to check that your prop shaft actually fits. The prop shaft supplied with the kit is the 35mm uh, and occasionally these gearboxes do have a 30 mil. It's very rare, but some of them do. If by any chance you happen to get one, if you ring Gina, she'll sort it out for you. Also on this gearbox, this is the five speed box, there's a little flange just here where I've marked it as you can see. Uh, it sticks out, it's just a small flange, and the gearbox actually fits better if you run a marker down there and just take the little wing off that's just standing out there. It won't weaken the gearbox in any way because there's still a full flange there. It just allows it to fit through the chassis better. Okay. If you're going to use a mini grinder, always remember to use your goggles because it's dangerous. chassis we're now going to thread it in forward if the compressor starts while I'm uh, doing it I apologize for the sound 
uh, the main thing is to watch what I'm doing. Right, let's lift the front. Clear. Now if you can push it in here. Keep coming. Keep coming. A bit further. Whoa there. Right. Stop to lower it now. Once you've got it to this stage, you'll find that you're coming up against the uh, bulkhead bar. So if you now start to lower it, so we can then gently lower and feed it in a little bit, lower it and feed it in a little bit more as we go. Right, we've now got the engine a little bit lower and as you can see it's progressively moving further back. Uh, just push it back a little bit more. Right, we'll uh, take it down again and then we'll continue doing this as we go in. At this point you might find it useful to put a rope round the back of the gearbox, possibly thread it over the chassis because we're going to have to raise the back of the gearbox so it enters through those uh, two chassis uh, <laughs> members. Uh, but at this moment in time it's still touching on the bulkhead. So we need now to lower the front end of the engine and gradually raise the back end of the gearbox and thread it slowly in. We've now progressed halfway, and as you can see, the end of the gearbox are now nice and coming into place. As you can see, the engine now is almost sitting on its mountain. This mounting has been bolted to the engine and we left the mounting off on the other side. Just put the rubber mounting in. Now, if we lower it the last little bit, we should be able to sit it onto this mounting. As you can see, it's nicely dropping onto the mounting. Well done. Must stress at all times, Always keep your fingers clear. If you're going to block it up, always make sure it's secure. And don't let <laughs> stop going until we go on it. And close the other engine mounting in position and the engine at a point where it just fits on it. You just slot the mounting on, turn it round, get one of the bolts, line it up, get one bolt in. the bolt in, then put the other two in below, put your washer and your nuts on the engine mounting and then you can tighten it all up. If you fitted the five speed gearbox beside cutting off the end of that angle section there, that inch and a half angle, you also need to snip off that corner of the floor. You can see I've marked it with a, with a dotted line. Just snip that off there along there and that gives you clearance for the gearbox. And the same the other side. There go. Yeah. You're right. But when we're fitting it in this application, the nut is in the wrong side. So what we're going to do is nut the nut out, it's on some small splines and then we'll use nuts and bolts instead. So if you just get a vise, you just fit it in, loosely tighten the vise around the grip of it, a punch or even screw an old bolt into it and then just hit it and you find it comes out. Do the same with the other. Right, so it's ready. It's now ready to uh, use on the gearbox. On some models you'll find that uh, this mounting is actually riveted to the cross member. So you've got a choice, you can either chisel the rivet out, you can drill it out, or use your mini grinder. Uh, if you use your mini grinder, don't forget to use your goggles. Uh, you don't require the engine mount, the gearbox mounting, so you can throw that out. As you can see,
see now we've got the front of the chassis quite high uh, in order that we can demonstrate how to fit the gearbox mount in and centralise it. At this moment the gearbox is, is just sitting on the cross member here. As you can see it's still movable. So we need to centralise it in order to put the mounting on on the underneath side. You can centralise it by looking at the little webs that we've cut off and you can get an accurate setting for it. If uh, the mountings, the engine mountings are tending to give it a bias one way or the other, you can just loosen the mountings and you'll find you'll be able to sit it where you want it to stay. Uh, or alternatively, you can just put a block in either side and just jam it centrally. As you can see, we're now underneath. I've got the gearbox mounting and I've got the bolt which goes through it. As you can see, here is where the gearbox mounting position. So if we put the bolt in, locate it on the gearbox, and then tighten it. As you can see now the mountain is quite close to the floor so you can now mark it for the centre of the holes and then we can take it off and then we can get a drill and drill it through. I'm about now to drill a pilot hole through, but always remember if you're working underneath, don't rely on just the hydraulics of a jack. Always make sure that you've got something substantial to protect your preferably axle stands, uh, or alternatively, don't work underneath the car. If there are any doubts about safety, don't work under the car until you've got something to make sure it's safe. Right. If you're going to drill, always make sure that you have your goggles on. You could do this down a pit. Yeah, if, if you've got an alternative, if you've got a pit, that's great, because then you can sit very safely and drill the holes. Right, I'm just going to put a pilot hole through. And that pilot hole on the other side. See those little turnings? Now you can see why I've got the goggles on. It is possible to drill the main holes from the top, but obviously we need to drill the pilot hole from the bottom to ensure that it's in its correct position. We'll now move to the top and drill the hole through. We've now drilled the holes through, I've slotted the bolts in from the top, we can now locate the mounting. Just screw it up. I can get a nut on. And a washer. We can push it it's a bit tight on the other side. You might need to just lift it or prod it. Oh, then. Right, I've just pushed it up with the back end of a hammer shaft so I can start the nut. Now I've got a nut and a washer on both sides. Get the spanner now and we can tighten the mounting up. And then the engine and gearbox should be secured in its position. Okay. Then finally tighten everything up. If you find that this is a little low, it is possible to trim some of it off so that it gives you a little bit more ground clearance. You can make a decision about that. It's easy enough to take out and put back later because the gearbox will actually stay sat in position on the mounting. Point you need to put the prop shaft in. But If 
line it up and then put your bolts in. Uh, don't forget that these bolts are special, they're blue. When you take them out of the donor, make sure you put them somewhere safe and that you don't lose them because they're the only bolts that fit. Okay. This is a good time at which to fit the Speedo cable. Uh, as you can see, access is quite tight and because we've fitted a narrow prop shaft cover tunnel, uh, it's necessary to take the cable outside the gearbox cover. So you'll find that when the gearbox cover is in position, the cable will run approximately in the position that I'm holding it now. Uh, so it's a good time to fit it and then fit the circlip in. When you cut the prop shaft cover of this side, you can cut a snip out to go over the cable or you can leave a larger hole so that you've got access for future if you've got any problems. With the engine and gearbox in, a good check to give you a, an average height at this point is to put a straight edge across the chassis and on the two-litre engine, which this is, it should more or less just about sit on the thermostat housing at the back. Uh, you will find that with the 1600 engines, which have got a shorter stroke, the block is a, a little bit shorter, and so you will have a, a larger space there on a 1600. That's it. More and more people are using the injection engine car. This does give you a little bit more work, but um, it does result in a more efficient and um, slightly more powerful 2B. The big problem is that it is a little bit more complicated and um, you've got more things to fit underneath the bonnet. So you can see you've got this um, large aluminium casting that forms the ejection apparatus that sticks above the engine about four inches. You can see it's got a slightly different distributor, um, lots of um, tanks and filters and things like that that you've got to accommodate and there is some more complicated tube work. Nevertheless it can be done. Um, the first thing you've got to remember is that you will definitely need the engine bay wiring loom but when you take the whole loom out of your Ford Sierra you'll see quite clearly that there is a separate loom for the engine bay so you really do need this engine bay wiring loom and you do need to label it up very carefully. Obviously it's a lot easier to supplement this, this engine bay wiring loom with our loom. There is a control box as well that you'll need and some relays. These have been fitted behind this panel just here. Initially we did say it was in order to cut a small hole in the bonnet and you could expose this aluminium casting. If it was polished up it would look quite acceptable. But now you can see we've now developed a new bonnet um, where there's a D-shape cut around the centre louver and then there's a nice um, insert put in the bonnet a fiberglass insert um, that you you can see there on the film and you'll probably agree that it looks quite neat and tidy. To distinguish these bonnets between the, the, the ordinary bonnet we've put an extra two louvers in each block so instead of the five louvers there's seven louvers so it does give it that appearance of a little bit more power. So they're available from us you will have to check because we haven't yet worked out the price on that. In the video I know you've all been waiting for. I'm going to go over the front suspension briefly and describe how it works. On the 2B we've got a system which is called the sliding pillar system which is quite an old system, it's been used for quite some time by several manufacturers. It has advantages and disadvantages but I'm sure in the case of the 2B it's the very best system that can be used and I'm sure it's going to be used a lot in kit cars in the future. In the past ourselves incl included amongst other manufacturers who have used various types of front suspension. On kit cars the most popular type is the whole front subframe from a donor vehicle. As we've progressed we've found out that this is quite unsatisfactory, too bulky, too heavy and unacceptable in general. Front stub axles are always a problem. There are two main types that you can use. One is a Ford Cortina and one is a Triumph Herald. Obviously both these are getting scarce. So we've looked for a new system and that's why we've chosen the sliding pillar. 
it utilises much of the components from the Ford Sierra. We've already gone over the McPherson struts and how we've stripped it down and we've used some key components, the stub axle, the chrome shaft from inside the McPherson strut, etc, etc. In the 2B, the top and bottom wishbones are fixed. They don't move at all, part of the chassis. We've made them look like wishbones so it looks correct to look at. The chrome shaft from the donor vehicle's McPherson strut is used in between the two wishbones. This is fixed, so the wishbones are fixed and the chrome shaft's fixed. You've noted that we've used a stub axle. To this we add our own tube which is locked in position in the same way as the McPherson strut is. This tube has two phosphorons bushes in it, one at the top and one at the bottom. There is also a grease nipple so it can be well lubricated. This is bolted into the same clamp that is used for holding the McPherson strut. When you go over a bump, quite simply, this part of the suspension, the stub axle from the Sierra, moves up and down on the fixed chrome shaft. That's it basically. Obviously there is a spring as well and there's a shock absorber. The shock absorber turns with the stub axle. On the system for about two years now and we're certain this is the answer, not just for Robin Hood but for the whole kit car industry. Most production cars now are using McPherson strut front suspension and we've looked at lots of others besides the Ford Sierra and nearly all of them can be utilised to, to, to make any kit car into a sliding pillar system. There is a main downside of this um, the reason why it's not used in production cars is that it does need constant, constant maintenance. Obviously with the stub axle sliding up and down on, on, on the shaft, on the pillar, it's, you have to make sure it's well greased. That's why we put a grease nipple in the insert. Cover a high mileage and therefore if you'd got to grease, suspension, to grease the suspension every thousand miles it would probably mean that you would grease it less than once a month or if the average kit car that does two or three thousand miles a year then it would mean just an annual or biannual grease. We're sure you won't find this a problem and you're sure you won't find it a chore greasing your front suspension and generally checking your car over. This is the shaft that you previously took out from the McPherson strut. It now needs some further preparation in order that we can use it on the suspension. First thing to do, if we look at this end, we've got a nut on and some parts. We need to remove the nut and also there's a flange ring on. We also need to remove that. So first of all, we'll remove the nut. Right, we've removed the nut, you've got several pieces here, but the only thing you're interested in at this point is the nut. Uh, I shall be using this nut for demonstration purposes, but we've actually got some special nuts ordered, uh, which will be here by delivery date, which you will get. So if you see that I'm using this nut, you will actually be using the nut that will be supplied with your kit. The next thing to remove is the flange. What I'm going to do is put it in the vise and if you look on it you'll see there's four spot wells as we look round it. I shall centre pop the centre of each spot well and then I'm going to drill them out. If you put it in the vise, if you clamp it with the thick end thread near the top because this piece of shaft doesn't slide through the bushes. With the shaft clamped in the vise with the ring, with one spot weld face upwards. You get a centre punch and then carefully spot it in the middle of the spot weld. Then you can turn it round and do the same to the other three.
Right, with the shaft now uh, on the bench drill, uh, I'm ready to drill a pilot hole through the punch marks on the ring. If you haven't got a bench drill, which you probably won't have, if you clamp it in the vise uh, and careful with your normal drill, wearing your goggles, drill a pilot hole through all the four, and then what I'm going to do after I've drilled the pilot hole, I'm going to use a large drill and drill out the spot levels. can now see the shaft with the four holes drilled. Don't be worried if you go a little bit too far into the shaft because a hole into the shaft will not be an obstruction to the bushes and the bushes operate mainly on both sides of that centre piece so they'll not, it's not a problem. You can go slightly into the shaft. What I'm going to do now is with the large drill in I'm going to now do the same with the large drill. shaft in the vise, I've put some uh, guards in here to stop it damaging this end of the shaft because this end of the shaft will be going through the bushes. And then with a chisel and a hammer, now that the whole, all the four holes have been drilled with a large drill, it should break away. As you can see, it's starting to break away. Right, now it's broken away so we can now slide it off. What we need to do now is just get an angle grinder and just trim these little holes up to make sure that there's no burrs uh, standing out that would obstruct the bushes. It's a good idea once you've drilled the shaft out to get some possibly 400 grit or something like that, wet and dry is fine. If you fold a sheet into four it makes a nice, so you can clean up. Then if you get the shaft with the vice end of sticking out of the vice, you can then give it a good run down, take any slight burrs off and give it a final polish. Uh, taking this ring off we have tried several ways, we tried grinding through it, cutting it, but Probably the best way we've found is the way I just showed. Explain the components that you need from the Ford Sierra. All these come from the McPherson strut that we've stripped down. As we look, we've got this cover that generally we don't need, but we've agreed it may be handy later on uh, to disguise some little bits um, for the front suspension for the SVA test. So we won't worry about that now. That is a bump stop, which we, we can use in our system. That is the bearing, the top bearing, which we definitely need. And then we've got the shaft here with the, the lower nut on the bottom, which we're going to retain at this stage. We've got a little valve thing, which I don't think we need, but we will hang on to. Then we've got the shaft with the nut on the top. The nut is quite important. You need that nut. And then, we move away, we move now to the to the stub axle. Again, we do need this with the flange with the um, studs on. It's a good idea just to whip off that pressed steel cover there and you could re-grease that or if you want to go all the way you could in actual fact um, put new bearings in. One of the things we've got to do is to trim away the bottom of the stub axle. This is the bottom 
where the lower track control arm goes in. Now, just here, we have one that's already been trimmed. You'll see one is one hand and one is the other. Hand. And you can see quite clearly that we've actually cut that piece from the bottom. So basically, on the plane of the face of that, we're going to cut along there, and from the edge, it's four and three eighths in inches. So we're cutting along there with a hacksaw or a grinder, a mini grinder, along there four and three, three eighths inches, and then straight down. And then that, that means you'll be able to remove a piece, something like that, off the bottom. The stub actually is already prepared. We've cut the piece out the bottom. Unfortunately, we've snapped the, uh, the clamp bolt in that, so we've drilled that out, and we've put a substantial nut and bolt through it. We have already drilled the hole just there for the lower shock absorber bolt. So that needs to be a 3 8 clearance hole, and you do need to drill it more or less in the centre of that triangle. As we look at it from behind, if we can see that there is another triangle there, and quite clearly it is smack in the middle of that little triangle. You have to so face it towards the camera. So that hole needs to be drilled in that, obviously from that side, from the back side, Drill an eighth hole first, keep your drill as square as possible, and straight through with a three eighths clearance drill. Ten mils is a little bit too big. To proceed with the 2B sliding filler front suspension system, I'm now going to go over all the components that are used. This is the stub axle. And, as you remember, we've already cut the piece out of the bottom and we've drilled the hole in it. So that is now ready to go on. From the donor vehicle, we've got the nut that fits on the top of the chrome shaft. The nice nylock nut. We've got the bearing came off the top we've got the washer that's associated with that knot that goes on top of that shaft we've retained only that special 9mm knot that came from the bottom of the chrome shaft, the one that had the little valve on it inside the McPherson strut, we've saved that. We've got the original bump stop that came down the middle of the McPherson strut and then finally we've got the bump stop that was on the back suspension of the Ford Sierra that fitted onto that cone that's welded on the chassis that is on the saloon. I will say, I've just been to look for one just now on a very late car we've just had come in, and it is different on the late ones. So we've got those components. If you haven't got one of those, then I'll cover that later on. We swing around. We come now to the components that are given to you by Robin Hood in the kit for the sliding pillar system, and that is the coil spring the phosphor bronze tube, the shock absorber. For this exercise we'll need one 10 mil by an inch bolt or 17 mil spanner size. We'll need one 3 8 by 3 inch UNF bolt with a couple of nylon locking nuts that go with it. We'll need one of the 9mm nuts that you get in your kit. You'll find two of them and they are fastened together with a little bit of masking tape. Although the 9mm, they're only a 30mm spanner size. A couple of washers to supplement those 
three eighths UNF nylock nuts, four approximately 22 mil OD washers with a three eighths hole in the middle. We've got the top swivel, which we call the top swivel. We've got a large diameter wa washer with a hole in the middle which is approximately 22 mil, 23 mil. We've got one washer that's supplied by ourselves with a hole in the middle that is big enough to take the top of the chrome shaft thread. We've got a top hat which is a new addition to the kit which is a chrome shaft locator. We've got a 6mm knock-in grease nipple. We've got some very very heavy wall um, it isn't tube it's bored out solid bar and the hole in the middle has been bored out to uh, about 8.5 I think. We've got a fancy diamond shape washer that is a lower washer and then we've got some tube which is supplied which is exactly 20 mil ID with about a 2 mil wall and then we've got the cycle wing bracket the newest type that we're producing they're all the kits, they're all the parts we're going to need to put the suspension together We're going to fit the component to the near side of the chassis. Um, first of all, we take the cram shaft, we try it in the hole at the bottom. If you've got to clear that hole, hole, hole out of the file, then just run a file through it to a drill. That should go through there. We are going to, first of all, try the shaft into the phosphorons tube. Now if you look at this we have trimmed that area around there. I'll just show you the original. see that we've trimmed an area from there off that corner slightly like that and we've drilled a hole in the corner the reason for that is that there are two different types of calipers you can fit so if you fit the standard ones are as we're doing today you do need to trim that corner off so we'll first of all start off by just trying the chrome shaft in the phosphorons tube. It isn't impossible that on some occasions you do just have to run some wet and dry inside it or some emery cloth just to clear it out. But that goes in there and that's quite a reasonable fit. If it's a little bit loose don't worry because that's how we've intended it to be. So the next thing we're going to do is to put this into the stub axle. So by taking the bolt out like that we're going to feed that in through there like that. It may be that 
as in lots of cases in the Robin Hood, you've just got to tap it with a hammer a little bit to get it in. So that's going to tap through there like that, and that goes through there, and then that will then line up with that, and so that there is between three eighths and nothing at the bottom of that, just there, we need to project through the back of that to drill that hole. So again, so that there's not between nothing and three eighths, as long as you do both the same, it doesn't matter, through the back of that and drill that hole. We've drilled through with a 10 mil clearance drill and then we need now to put that single 10 mil nut and bolt through that we've selected out of the nut and bolt pack just in order to um, in order to fix it so that we can locate it. So that will go through there, we'll pop that on there like that and just tighten that up. So that's now tight and we're now going to put the bolt in that goes through the top like that. So that's going to go in with a 19mm spanner size, tighten that up. Um, it doesn't have to be that tight at this stage, but it obviously has to be tightened up and that clamp pinches the top of the phosphorons tube. So that's together. You can see here how we've cut the bottom just there. I would have liked to have seen that been a little bit more precise so you haven't got that gap there. So we've just cut probably a 3 16th of an inch too much off that just there. The next stage is to explain a little bit more about the, the system. And we come to what we're calling the top half or the chrome shaft locator, which is that item there. Now this is a relative new addition to the kit and we have retrospectively supplied these to customers in the past but everyone obviously gets this this in in the kit now so that is that does sit on the bottom of there like that and the idea is that if people thought perhaps in the past that that nine mil stood on the bottom was a little bit weak or, or not man enough for the job then we've got this shaft held in firmly in that like that so when that's bolted to the bottom, then obviously that shaft, shaft can't go anywhere and we're not relying on that thread. Um, the main problem we had in the past that this is a genuine um, chrome shaft from a genuine um, Ford part, but if people had, had fitted to the cars non-genuine parts, and often we found that that was a less than, than 9 mil, some was 8 mil and some was even less than that. So that goes on the bottom like that. Another problem we found from the early days that the suspension worked perfect except for the fact when you went over a pothole then this tended to drop down and bang on that lower arm um, which was a little bit unfortunate so we decided that we'd have a bump stop on the bottom for that to rest on so what we did we looked around for various suitable um, material and we, we came up with the conclusion that the very best thing was a, was a, a tie bar kit rubber from a Mark 4 and 5 Cortina. That was a nice neoprene type thickish washer that went on the bottom that was the right size and that was the very best thing. Now if you haven't got that or you don't want to go out and buy that kit then we suggest what you do is you take the bump stop from the back suspension of the car. So you recognize that. That, that pushes into the chassis under the back spring and it um, it fits on that conical um, part of the bodywork that's welded on, you can't get off. So we've taken that and we've simply cut the first section off it like that to give you this same kind of neoprene type rubber. And it's conveniently got a recess in it that's not far wrong for what we want. This has been cut to about three quarters of an inch. I would have liked to see it been cut just a little bit thicker. So when you cut it, I'll just put it back together again, you might want to cut it to that first corner and not in the middle of the... Um, so we'd like to see it cut just there to make it a little bit thicker. 
snag is the thicker you have it, the more difficult it is to put your suspension together. This is probably what, why the person that did this cut it I mean, a little bit thinner. So we've got that, and that's going to sit on the bottom. And very, very, very conveniently, we can see that that part of the top hat sits inside that. And then also, very, very conveniently, that that is a nice tight fit on the bottom of that. So with that being a tight fit, and that recess being there for the, for the top hat, then that works quite well. So we're going to carry on. When this stub axle is jumping up and down, so that it um, doesn't bang with the clamp on the bottom, we've put the bump stop to spread the weight for the bump stop. In the kit, you're going to get this washer, which will have a hole in it, which will be about 22 mil. So that will go on next, like that, so that the relatively small diameter of the um, phosphorons tube is now enlarged to spread the weight better onto the bump stop like that. So the next thing we're going to do is to pop this over here. We've had it on before, we know it goes on. And that goes over there like that. Now, what I would say is that at the end of the day, that will go on the bottom. And we do need to drill two small holes in this, or preferably three. So we've got one, two, three. And in your kit you'll find you've got three small five mil long cadmium plated set screws or bolts and there's some nice um, nuts supplied that will hold it on. So that will then be drilled and bolted in position on the bottom so that all the, all the stresses from the bottom movement of the suspension will be taken in that, as well as the, the original hole in the bottom and as well as the pin. So we're certain now that solved the problem of that. Obviously, if you drill those holes in that, it would be a good idea to drill to hold that in position and drill that first so all the holes will line up later so you're not struggling to do that later. And if you make an obvious difference in the position of the three holes, then you'll be able to get it in the right position. You won't get two right and one wrong. Okay. When you have got the, the holes drilled in the top of that top hat and you projected the holes through the bottom member you will need to drill a further washer which is that nice shaped diamond shaped washer that does correspond with the shape of that bottom member, like that. So, whilst you're drilling the holes, you do need to incorporate that in the system so that you drill the whole lot in one go like that. Probably grab that together with a pair of vice grips and drill through. Remember that you need a good drill and you need to drill slowly, if necessary, get someone alongside you, just squirt a little bit of coolant, some lubricant on the drill so that it makes it easy to drill through. So we've got all the holes ready to go through that, they all line up and we've made sure we offset the three holes so you've got no chance of getting that wrong. We then carry on now with the assembly and the explanation of the assembly by pushing that up there and putting that chrome shaft locator on the bottom like that. And now we're going to carry on by putting that through the bottom hole like that and offering that up. Now everything's gone all right up to now and you can see that we've got gap between that top shoulder 
and the underside of that member. And it looks to me to be around about seven eighths of an inch, which is, is okay. If it's less or it's more, you can compensate it with the spacers that I'm going to, um, to show you now. So the next component that goes on is a cycle wing bracket. And the cycle wing bracket is pretty straightforward. Make sure you get the right one on the right side. So the one that I'm holding here now is the one for the near side. So that simply goes over the top like that. And eventually that tag will go down and it will be bent down onto that forging just there. It's tended, intended to go kind of between those two webs just there. But as long as you get that on, that's all that matters. The, the, the position of it doesn't matter that much. Wing bracket on. And remember that all that holds this in position, apart from that one bolt that I'll tell you about later on, is the pressure of the spring. So the next thing is the spring. You can see that we've compressed the spring with these spring compressors. And we've um, had to just slightly modify the spring compressors so that they grip this small diameter spring well. And we've compressed the spring to such a height that when it's put on there, the top of the spring is lower than that shoulder on the chrome shaft. Now, we've also, the bump stop, which I've shown you from the McPherson strut, we've got that now in the middle of the spring. We had to put that in before the spring compressors. Be very careful because if you forget to put it in, it's a real job to squeeze it in afterwards. So what happens now is we're going to put this lot onto the uh, chrome shaft. So very carefully, or oh, just remember when you're tightening these spring compressors up, to keep them directly opposite each other, 180 degrees to each other. If you don't get them exactly opposite, then they swing round and the spring shoots off and uh, will hit you in the jaw. So we're now going to put this on here, put the bump stop down the middle of the chrome shaft. It's tricky, but yes, that's gone on. That's gone on nicely. And that's great. That's gone on like that. And just as we'd hoped, we've got the shoulder at the top of that chrome shaft below the height of the spring. Now, the next thing to go on is the top swivel. And the top swivel is a little bit agricultural, but it does work well. You can see it's made up for several plates, a washer, a bolt, and it has a hole in the middle. Um, I'm going to disregard this because we've got one which we did earlier, which is just the same. The only difference is that we've just ground the, the, the one of the edges off that nut bolt that's welded on. So we've just ground that off there so it does clear. So the next thing to go on is this top swivel. So that now goes on and it goes over the chrome shaft. So we've still got the chrome shaft sticking out at the top like that. And you'll see that that washer that's welded on the bottom, that locates the spring and does keep the spring central like that. Right, we're carrying on now. The next thing to go on is the bearing. you remember the bearing because the bearing has got a nice plastic sleeve around it and this is the original bearing and just make sure that it is in good nick um, make sure there's no grit in it and it does work and it hasn't collapsed it does seem a very very weak bearing but um, it always does seem to work so that's the next thing that goes on like that now what will actually happen is that when all this goes together the shoulder of that chrome shaft will sit inside the, the bearing and the chrome shaft and the bearing centre will all become one. And the chrome shaft, the bearing centre and the actual chassis will all become one and they won't move at all. What will move is the outside of the bearing and the top swivel which will become one. That will go on there like that. So in order to allow the top swivel to, to turn, it means we've now got to cut a spacer 
from the material which I showed you earlier, which was that piece of tube, which is 20 mil OD with a two mil wall. We need to cut a spacer, and that spacer wants to equate to the gap that we have between the top of the bearing and the underside surface of the chassis or the top bracket. So we're taking that, we're measuring that, and we're going to cut it a piece of tube, which I've conveniently cut and deburred just here. And we've cut that to that size. That will now go on top, just for good measure, so that the whole thing's very, very tight. We don't want it to be loose. We don't want to have to be pulling these nuts and these two the nuts up on the top and bottom of the shaft and pulling these two members together. We don't want to do that. We'd sooner sprag them apart a little bit and it is in order to get a little piece of wood and put it in there and tack those apart. You can sprag them apart by an eighth of an inch or a quarter inch so that the, the chrome shaft is trapped on the two shoulders very tightly between the two members of the chassis. So for good measure, we're putting that on top like that. And to spread the weight, we're going to put that original washer that we took off the McPherson structure system, which is just a bit better quality washer than what you would normally get. It's, it looks like it's a machine washer, and it's about two mil thick. So that's going to go on top of there like that. And all that lot is now going to go underneath there. Now this is a reasonable fit. I would have liked to seen it a little bit tighter. I would have liked to see you see me struggling with that. But that's gone underneath there like that. As I said, I would have liked to seen it being a little bit tighter. But that's okay for this video. The fact we've got something easy is good. So that's gone underneath there. Is there any questions? Not yet, no. Not yet, no. Right, so... My camera person knows more about this than me because we've done this several times already. So that goes on top of there like that. And we're going to continue now to try to complete this because this is going quite well. So we're now going to take the large washer that you get in the kit with the hole in that fits on there. And that goes on top there like that. And then we're going to put the, the nylon locking nut, again the original nut, that's going to go on top of there. I'm going to tighten that up because the quicker we can get these clamps off, the better, the less chance we've got to do damage. So this is now a this is now a 19 mil spanner size. We're going to tighten that up like that until it's tight. Now you'll see it's starting to twist. The chrome shaft is starting to twist. So conveniently. The people at Ford have put a Allen key slot in the top of the shaft so we can hold it like that. So we hold that while we tighten it. If by any chance you get any bogus struts that haven't got these in the top, then it is in order to get a pair of vice grips there and grip the chrome shaft at the top where it doesn't, um, where it doesn't matter. So we're tightening that up. Now at this stage now, I'll just draw your attention to the fact that we've got that slot in the top. I want to just show back to the side, cameraman. You'll see there's a slot in the top. And this slot is there because it means then that you can alter the, the, the camber on it quite easily. So that will move backward and forward like that to alter the camber. But having said that, we're going to put it in the neutral position now, while we obviously we're a long way off actually getting this the wheels on and on the road. But we're going to put it in that neutral position so the washer is flush with that. And then we can tighten that up quite a lot so it won't move um, while we build up the rest of the top. But that is how we're going to adjust the, the camber. Not the caster, remember the caster is how much it, it moves that way the camber is how much it moves in and out. So just while I'm talking about that, remember that if you put a spirit level on the edge of the wheel, we're looking for the top of the wheel to be a quarter of an inch further in than the bottom. So you can get some pressure on this, and that will tighten up quite tight. And if you tighten up tight enough, 
until you actually get ready for on the road. What happens in real life that once you do get it set up and you do set the, ca the camber correctly, then you'll drill through this plate, there, this washer, there and there, and you put two small six mil nuts and bolts in there, it will fix that tight, you'll bolt it through, and you'll carefully put the, um, you'll carefully put the, uh, the nuts, lock, nylon locking nuts underneath, and that'll fix that. Now, the next thing we've got to do is, this is looking quite good, is we're going to release the, um, we're going to release the, the clamps on the spring. Right, to be truthful, this is about five minutes it's taken me to undo these spring clamps. But they're nearly off now. It's a real pain. Particularly if you've got to do this again because you forgot to put the bolt stop in the middle of the spring or something like that. But no, it's worthwhile because everything's going all right. It's nearly off. Right, they're off. Okay, and we can see that this is working quite well. So we've got that top swivel pointing forward. We've got that, remember, ready to tap down in between. Down there, tap that down there like that. And then we'll eventually drill that and put a, an 8 mil bolt through it. You see where I've got my fingers through there, an 8 mil, mil bolt through there. But don't do that yet, because you need to have your wheel and tyre on, so you can get the brackets dead right distance from the tyre. We're going to carry on now with this. This is looking really good. Um, remember that you do need to put your disc on sooner or later to make sure that on full lock, the disc doesn't catch on that bottom. We, we've recently changed this dramatically after had um, a lot of problems with that catching on the earlier cars but that now try your disc on um, make sure it's the correct disc the ventilated disc remember you can only put ventilated discs on if the calipers are ventilated calipers so don't do what lots of people have done with bought ventilated discs because it's cheap to find out they're no good with the plain discs so try your disc on so we're very close now to finishing this off um, the next thing we want now is the um, shock absorber You've got this material here, that it was Gisa, which is approximately an inch long and um, that spacer goes in there like that. So we've got the three inch long 3 8 bolt, we've got the shock absorber and the washers that we've always recommended people fit, but people don't seem to. These large diameter 3 8 hole washers. We're going to put that on there first like that. That through there. Another washer. The inch spacer. Like that. And then that now is going to go through the hole that you've drilled in there. But the tighter that hole can be, the better. Um, it needs to be 3 8 clearance and then you're going to put the nylon locking knot on there like that and they do vary a little bit these stub axles but in this one there's a nice little recess do you want I can't swing it there's a nice recess there for the knot to go in so if you just get it started and then get your spanner here while I tighten the, the bolt up. Remember very much in the way that we made the center shaft of the suspension system and the other compa components all one. In this case we're trying to do the same. We're trying to make the, the stub axle, the bolt, the spacer 
the washers and the inner metal bush in the rubber shock absorber all one so that the shock absorber will then turn the rubber will turn on the metal shaft we fix the inner metal bush of the shock absorber so that's now fixed and it is something that you do need to tighten up to check it's tight and the next thing is that we're going to go on now and we're going to put a washer on there like so and then we're going to put the shock absorber on just tap it slightly like that and then we put another washer on there and the 9mm, sorry, the um, 3 8 UNF knot. Now, as I'm tightening this up now, this has gone together quite well, and there is this thread is quite long on here because there is the provision that you can space out this shock absorber if it's close to the spring. So you could, if you wanted, put a spacer or some washers on first to bring this shock absorber out. There is a plastic dust cover on these shock absorbers and you can take the plastic dust cover off if you want to give you some more clearance. So that goes on there like that and you can see how the system works. That it, there it is going round like that and that's basically it. This does adjust round, that will move, it will find its own position. So you'll find when you've got the tyre on that all that clears the tyre and um, that basically is, is it complete. So you can see, just to recap then, that we've got the centre shaft fixed in tightly. It has trapped the centre of the bearing and um, the outside of the bearing is turning with the spring and with the top swivel and the shock absorber. Quite a clever system and it truthfully does work well. If you just come down here, cameraman, you can see, see that the lower bump stop is very, very nicely compressed by the washer, all the weights on it. But obviously, once the weight of the car is reversed and you've got the car on the road, then that will lift that off. And as I said previously, it does hover about an inch from the bottom, so it's just in the nice position. It just leaves that bottom plate to put on there, to put that on, and to, um, once that's on, then you'll get the, um, the nuts on the bottom and you'll pull it all tight um, with the 9mm um, the nut that we've given you and then you can supplement that with the other um, nut that came with it initially. So that's, that's basically the whole system. Remember to check that bolt that goes through the bottom there periodically to make sure there's no wear on it. Check it at least every MOT. And the reason we put these washers on here is to give support to the rubber bushes in the shock absorber. One of the popular questions we get asked is that there is only a quarter of an inch clearance between the tyre and the spring. Yes, that is in order. There isn't any more than that. If you're a little bit worried, then you will find that these studs are quite long and you can put a very thin spacer in there or some washers just to pack the wheel out a little bit. But it does run close to the spring in any event. I've just sat and viewed through the front sliding for the suspension assembly and it does seem quite clear and I don't think that you builders should have any problems with it. There's just one or two things I want to draw to your attention. That when we did finally put on the lower plate underneath the lower suspension arm, I did notice that there wasn't an awful lot of the sliding pillar chrome shaft lower stud coming through the bottom. There was in fact half an inch, which was sufficient that once we've got that lower diamond shaped plate on, to put on the 9mm knot that we gave you in the kit and pull it up tight. 
But what this indicated to me was the fact that when we assembled the system and we, made, we measured for that spacer, that tubular spacer on top of the strut, that the way we'd assembled it, the actual lower shoulder of that chrome shaft wasn't actually sitting on the lower plate. The bump stop had, in fact, pushed it up. So what it means is that, although I did indicate to you that I was anxious to get that a tight fit, it appeared to be tight, but that lower shoulder wasn't actually on the lower plate. So what I want you to do is, before we start on this assembly, is the first job to do is to take the crankshaft on its own and make that top spacer. You will remember that I was quite pleased that it went in well without any fuss, but I also indicated that it shouldn't be as easy as that. In fact, it shouldn't. Now, I did also touch on the wooden sprag, which sounds a bit coarse and crude, but in fact, this is what you need to do. That when you've initially made the spacer and it works well without anything on it, when you do come to put it all together as I did, it will appear too big. So this is why you'll need to make the wooden sprag to tap in to push the two wishbones apart so it's a really tight fit and obviously when you take the wooden sprag out then it'll clamp together and you'll find there is lots and lots of thread at the bottom for you to put the the hour 9mm knot on and then finally part of the original knot that you use as a lock knot. Now it seems that you could also get around this by pulling the putting the plate on the bottom and putting the knot on the bottom first and pulling it up tight. But obviously, if you do that, then it means that the shaft won't be able to be able to be lifted outwards. It won't be able to be able to rock on the bottom plate, so you won't be able to lift it out um, in order to put all the assembly on. I've said use a wooden sprag. We've obviously tried this and it does work quite well. Um, but you could use a, a small bottle jack or a porter power type hydraulic system, or just an ordinary screw jack, but it's a little bit like the old coal miners, that they always said that the, the, the wooden props that they used down the pit was a lot better than the metal ones, because it gave them more movement and they could actually hear when the prop was breaking. So I prefer to use a wooden prop for this, and it does work well, trust, trust me. Now obviously, as you all probably realise, it's important that this system is well greased and therefore we give you in the kit two grease nipples. These are known as knock-in nipples and they're an interference fit. You simply drill a 6mm hole, you must hold the drill very straight and precise and just drill straight through into the outer casing, 6mm, and then you get the, the nipple and it knocks in. Don't just knock it in with a hammer. Get an old socket, one of those small sockets in your mini socket set that you never use and put that round the nipple head and bang it in on the shoulder. And it will knock in and it won't come out again ever. Remember, we've not put this nipple in before. You may say it's easier to put it in the vise and drill it in the machine drill and do it like that. We've not done that before because if you do it last and then you get the car more or less completed, you're able to then move the steering wheel to and fro, move the suspension, move the wheel from its, both its positions and then you'll see the most suitable place to get your grease gun in to grease it. No good putting the nipple in the position, you can't get a grease gun in afterwards. Remember, you can see that we've done quite a bit of research into the grease and grease intervals now with this system and we're quite happy that it doesn't need nearly as much grease as what we first thought and it appears that any good quality grease is okay. Um, I don't want you to over grease this because we have had reports that grease is coming out and going onto the discs which obviously if you don't over grease it or you wipe off the surplus grease that squeezes out after you've greased it then that's all that's sufficient to do. Remember when you grease it all you're doing is putting your grease gun on, pumping a few pumps and waiting for the old grease to come out. With regards to the lower bump stop, there's all kinds of things you can use for this and I did refer to using that bullet from the uh, rear suspension and it also say that there was a, a different type bump stop on the later cars and we looked at that, it's possible to use that, that would work quite well.
those of you who've got the plus pack will obviously notice at this stage we haven't yet touched on the wishbone suspension. This will come later. One small thing with regards to that lower knot, the 9mm knot that you get in the kit, we've asked you to supplement that with the other 9mm knot that came on the bottom of the barrel on the person struck. You may have to trim this off slightly to make it relatively small. And you've also got to trim off the surplus amount of thread that sticks down from the retaining bolts that hold this sandwich construction of plates on the bottom of the arm. Um, the latest kits that we are supplying come now with 15 inch wheels. Uh, previous kits have 14 inch wheels. If you're using 13 inch wheels, particularly alloy wheels, you could find that there's a, a limited amount of movement on this and on the heavy corner and braking you may find that with an alloy wheel, because of the thickness of the wheel, it could just touch on these bolts at the bottom. If this is the case, then you will need a stronger bolt stop in the bottom. Remember, in any event, if you do have your wheels balanced, make sure that um, this isn't an area where the tire fit is glue on the self adhesive weights. Make sure that they're out of the path that this pin that comes down at the bottom. Just one final point on this front sliding pillar suspension. The final omission is the fact that on the lower shock absorber fitting, that there is the tubular spacer. Remember, it's very, very thick wall bored out bar, and I did say it had an 8.5 hole in the middle. This means that you do have to drill through it to accept the 3 8 bolt. So you do need to put a 3 8 drill through that piece of inch long spacer in order to get the bolt through. On the second part of this video, and we're going to do the transmission tunnel. The seat back panel, which you've already fit in, we're going to take out. So we've already robbed this of the fuel tank for another car. We take out the seat back panel now, and we're now going to fit the two panels that make up the transmission transmission tunnel, one front, one back on both sides. There are two panels, one is 29 inches long and one is 24 inches long. Sorry, one is 31 inches and one's just over 24 and both are approximately a foot deep and there's two each of these. We're going to start with the longer one of the two and this panel goes as far forward as the cross tube that the pedals fit onto. So we put down the front of that tube like that and we line up the front of that panel, the end of the panel with the front of the tube. And now with a marker we mark where the cross tube goes, which we know is an inch and a half wide, and we're now going to take a little bite out of that, a mouse hole, so that it'll fit round the tube. We're going to put an inch fold on this panel so we know that that hole needs to be an inch plus an inch and a half which is two and a half inches. So we're going to mark the top of the hole just there and just check on the inch and a half, yes. So we need to take a bite out of this which is going to be approximately something like that. So with a pair of tin snips, gilbos, jigsaw, we're going to snip that out. Like so. And 
We'll just tap it flat again like that. Now, so we don't forget, we go and mark this as F for face, or better still, O. U T for outside, that's the outside. So if that's the outside, then we need to mark it from behind because we're going to put a fold in it. So we decided on an inch fold. So inch there. It's just there like that. Length of one inch by one inch by one eighth angle. This is used predominantly for the underfloor strengthening member that picks up on the handbrake. You need to cut this at 46 and a half inches, like so. That is the length of piece that you'll need to go underneath the car where the handbrake is and at 46 and a half it'll pick up on the two lower side tubes. So put that to one side because we don't need that yet. The off cut that's left will eventually be used or part of it will be used to go on the front to act as a rail to pick up the bonnet safety catch or the bonnet catch. But in the meanwhile, we're going to use this piece to form the corner or the return bent edge of the sheet. Now, we've chosen a trolley. It's probably a trolley that you've had your kit on when you collected it. And it has a piece of angle conveniently along the top. But you can make something like this, or you might have an old bedstead in your wife's bedroom you could use or something like that but I'm using this so that I can bend the section over the corner of obviously some of you who are engineers will have folding machines but most of you will have to make something like this. So with a couple of pairs of vice grips like that, we just snap that on there like that. And we're now going to tap that over so that it forms a 90 degree bend. Now remember we marked out on the other side because that is the outside. So we need to have the corner on the outside so we need to work from the inside. Remember, if you do get it wrong, it's not the end of the world because you can um, use it on the other side. So we're going to, a wooden block, a piece of wood, a hammer, and we'll start off by just putting the corners up the line. pretty good. There are quite a few panels that you'll have to do this with. The shorter they are, the easier, but this is probably the longest one that there is. So we've got that formed like that. So we will now offer it up to the car.
We're now going to offer the panel up. So it goes in like that, around the tube, and yes, that's provisionally quite good. Now, we need to look because the panel needs to change direction in a couple of places. So we can see that the end of it needs to turn around to follow the shape of that tube. And just here, where the downright goes, in order for it to pull up tight to that downright tube, then it needs to change direction there. So just by spying at it, we're going to put a white mark there and directly above that bend in the top tube just there. And then all we're going to do is with the snips, put two small cuts in it. So we're snipping like that and we're snipping like so. We now put the panel back in the car with the help of some grips we're going to grip that onto there like that and then you'll see that, that will bend nicely just there if we can look in the top, then, now I need you to look down here, cameraman, this panel in, okay. that this, when we put this panel in, there's plenty of room between the panel and the gearbox casing, or in this case, it is the starter motor housing. So we, need, we can bend this out at the point where we've made the incision, so there's plenty of room there, the more room you've got, the better, providing that your wife hasn't got size 10 feet. Plenty of room there, so to clear that. And we're going to push that up like that, so when we screw it in, it's fastened onto that upright just there. So we're going to make a start screwing it in position now, um, making sure that it's clear of the gearbox. So start it. Ready? Yeah. So starting off at the end, we're going to drill a hole just there. And put a screw in. Remember, as I said earlier, if you are going to weld your 2B, screw it all together first. Don't weld it whatever you do because you will have to take some of these panels out again. Screw it into the 0.7 material. Um, and remember that when you screw it into the tube, which I'm going to do next, it's important that you do get the hole directly on the apex of the tube, or else the drill will wander and um, you'll find it quite difficult. So, the spine down it. Okay. 
and the end where the gear, sorry, the handbrake hole is, we're going to bend the tunnel side like that where we've got the nick in it. And if the vice grips will reach in, which won't really, we'll get these longer ones, then we need to pull the floor up and put a screw just there. We've got some more screws in the end of there. It hasn't particularly pulled it up very well, but remember across directly under there will be the, the member I referred to earlier, the inch by inch by eighth angle. That will help pull it all together. We're now going to put an inch fold on the bottom of the smaller of the two panels and put that into position. Bear in mind that that back hole there for the handbrake lever that bolts into the existing hole in the handbrake there will also be a hole in this return flange here that will sandwich the whole lot together so I'm now going to put the fold on the bottom of this and offer it up so you... with the inch return on the lower part of the smaller panel that can be offered in like that tuck it behind the other panel and fit it so that it's level with the end of the floor, just there. Now remember that we did say there's that hole again just there, the hole is just there, that we will sandwich a lot, that will be trapped in by the handbrake when the handbrake goes on there. So that will cover that hole like that, it looks like it's overlapping the other panel by about an inch and a quarter which is great. So we can at this stage now Put one screw in this end here, through all three. Like so. If you hear a funny groaning noise in the background, it, it's actually the dog. Very content at the moment. You'll notice a bit of a sag in the floor. What will happen is I'll prop the floor up from underneath and I'll put a row of screws in the bottom there. Um, I'm making sure that the yoke of the diff, there is at least the width of my finger, which is three quarters of an inch, between the tunnel side and the yoke. So we'll put a row of screws in the bottom, that'll pull the floor up. And then what will happen then is we'll move strangely enough onto the seat. Because before you actually fit the tunnel sides in, you must make sure the seat is going to fit. So I'm assuming that you're going to fit the widest seats possible, which are the Ford Sierra seats. And I'll go over fitting the seats with you. It's now in position. We've got about a two inch gap between there and there and we've agreed that we've got a three-quarter inch gap between the yoke of the prop shaft and the side of the tunnel. Note it isn't fastened at the top there, but it is fastened at the bottom in more or less a straight row from this top tube. Again, remember we've covered up that hole just there for the handbrake, which will finally drill from underneath, and we've put self-tapping screws all the way along the bottom. At this stage now, it's essential that we try the seat in, particularly if you're going to fit the Ford Sierra seats. So we'll just jet across to a seat and I'll go over what you have to do to the seat. This is a Ford Sierra seat that we've already taken the lower sliding mechanism from. Um, you may be tempted to try to fit the seat with this sliding mechanism but it does elevate you into the air quite a lot so unless you're a dwarf I'd advise you to take off that mechanism and fix the seats onto the floor directly. So we've taken off the bottom sliding mechanism. It's still leaving a few brackets that are held in by the torque drive screws. So we now need to take off that front rail with the 
for screws and those two little bits, uh, two little small brackets there. Hang on to these brackets, they're nice little brackets, they might do uh, somewhere else in the kit to make something with. And that also looks quite handy. We're also taking off these springs, one, two, three, four, five, six springs, and that little uh, mattress type uh, thing there. Don't throw these springs away, you never know when you might want a spring one day. Nice spring, save the springs. Um, and in addition, we're taking off the plastic covers and the mechanism that tilts the seat. We can still, sorry, we're keeping the mechanism on that tilts the seat, but we're taking off the operational handle. You will be able to tilt your seats in the future, but by using a small spanner um, instead of this big handle. So we're taking all that off. So we've got a seat just here that we've actually already done that work to. So you can see that that seat is prepared like I've explained to you. We're now going to try to fit this seat into the car. This is as we need a passenger seat. Remember these seats only just fit in. If they were a quarter inch wider they wouldn't fit. Make sure that you ground these two front of the subframe fixing bolts as flush as they'll go. Make sure that you've got the maximum cut off the end of the thread of that bolt that goes through the trailing arm. Give it a bit of a beat with a hammer. As far across as possible and then for good measure you may need just to get the seat you'll find that those two often just stick out a little bit so just give those a swift blow like that with the hammer won't do them any harm and then that will ensure that your seat will fit in so so we're now going to try the seat in and We'll try it in like that. You can see that that neatly goes in like that. It fits in nice and square. And we can still get at the mechanism to adjust the seat there, the back tilt. And the point of coming to, the reason we haven't fitted the top of the tunnel is that if necessary, if it is tight, then that tunnel will bend inwards like that. In this case, we're not doing too bad for space. Um, that's the seat in position. It's touching the back there. It fills the space nicely. And um, we can then go on now and fasten the tunnel in all the way along the top there like that. Incidentally, um, to hold the seat in, if we just go back to the seat we have across here, in the, in the kit we did supply with 8mm threaded rod so into those holes there where those torque drive screws go then you'll be able to put some of that 8mm threaded rod with a lock nut on it leave about 2 inches sticking out and you'll get 4 studs coming out of the seat that you can drill the floor and fasten the seat in. You may have trouble with the one directly underneath the strengthening plate, so you may get away with just three. We move to another car that's stainless steel panelled that we're a little bit further on with and you can see that in this car we've got the fuel tank in and we've got the seat back panel in position Again, only temporary because it could have to come out again. And we've got the two tunnel sides and the handbrake in. Take note that we've um, got the tunnel sides with self tapping screws at the top, but we've now replaced the um, self tapping screws in the bottom for 6mm nuts and bolts. So you see, all the way along there, we've re taken the self tapping screws out and substituted. 
six mil nut, nut and bolt, the couple in the tunnel there, and they go forward. Now, the point we're coming to now, as you can see, we've just planished over the top of the um, tunnel sides, gone over the top like that. With a hammer, we've planished it over with a hammer, just tapped it gently, and now we're going to fit the tunnel top panel, the one that looks like a cricket bat with a hole in it. Or so to fit this, we're going to take the gear stick out and we're going to offer up the hole so as it is directly above the hole in the in the gearbox top like that and we're going to fasten it in provisionally with a few screws basically we're going to planish over the edge so we need to put a bit of a crank in this end where the tank is so we'll just do that by hand like so that and then if we mark it from behind we can put quite a sharp crank in that there and we'll put a nick no we won't put a nick or we'll just ensure that it's directly above the hole like that that's good we'll just form it so it goes down into the corner as much as we can right into the corner if you keep it curved then it looks neat I don't know if it doesn't quite reach the top because the dashboard will just come down there so what I'm going to do now and there's no point in you watching this while I do it because the video will be not four hours, not five hours, but it'll go on all through the night. So I'm going now to put a few self-tapping screws, probably half a dozen, into the tunnel top to hold it in position, because the next stage is I'm going to planish over the sides. So one, two, three, four, five, six, six self-tapping screws. I'm going to do that now. Remember, a little bit difficult. If you don't, if you don't drill the tube directly on the apex, the drill wanders and the drill snaps. Okay, we've got the tunnel top now screwed in position. The cameraman's told me there's more than six screws in it, which there is. Um, you'll notice that we've bent the end just there and we've temporarily clipped it to the petrol tank. Don't drill into the petrol tank, whatever you do. Remember the petrol tank's there. Just be a bit careful with it. We're taking the wire strips off that end. We've got a neat corner just there, as you can see. All we did was get a bit of tube there and just beat, beat it like that the corner. And now we're going to form the edge of the tunnel top over the side panels. Now I've got a, a one and a half pound ball pane hammer. I'm using this because that's probably what you've got. We could use wooden mallets, raw shrinking hammers, all kinds of things, but that's what you've got in your shed that you bought from the cheap tool man and that's what we're going to use. So with this we're just going to carefully tap the corner over like so A little bit in the corner is a tricky bit just there.
basically that's it. What I'm going to do now is to take it off and put it on a flat level surface and planish this from the inside so that it's a little bit smoother and it hasn't got those, uh, those uh, sharp corners in it. So I'm going to take it off and lay it on a flat surface and planish it from the other side. I'm going to do both sides and then basically that then is the tunnel top complete. Um, the next thing we'll, we'll cover is when we cover it with either leather cloth or carpet. We're now back to the mild steel car again now and the next job is to fit the body side panels. Now we've deliberately left those till last simply because uh, particularly with the stainless steel ones we don't want to damage them. So while we're branching hammers and leaning over the side etc it's better that these panels are left off. So we're now going to fit them um, to the car and we're going to fit them carefully. Remember that with this car we haven't yet screwed the floor from underneath. Remember that was going to be one of your early operations that we're putting screws all the way along the tubes at the side from underneath and directly into this tube here. So they're not in it yet. So um, we'll probably carry on and put the side panels on without those, but bear in mind you've got to do that. Go. Okay. Before you fit this panel, just r run your hand over the edge of the tube like that. Along there, along the bottom. Make sure there's no lumps of weld sticking out. We've already ground that weld there that was a little bit proud. But look for weld splatter. Even the smallest little lump of weld will, will press through the outer panel and show when you painted it, particularly with the stainless. It's a little bit like the princess and the pea. Just one small bit to a perfectionist would spoil it. So we get the panel and we offer it up. So we go like this, we hook it over the top and we slide it along the members like that until it terminates at that top wishbone tube just there. We then look at the back and we can see that we've got to trim a little bit off that end. In actual fact we've got to trim off around about an inch. We take off an inch just there, like that. Directly below that point, we need to make an incision in the bottom return, just there. And we're going to make the incision and stop right about three eighths from the edge. Now, we don't put that incision in simply because it would make the panel very wobbly. So it's pretty definite, but between you getting the kit from us and fitting the panel, we let it bend. So we've left that for you to cut. So we're going to just slip that like that. Don't go right up to the edge, stop about three eighths before. And just here, we're going to take that bit out top like, like so. Remember this, I've tipped the car on its side to make it a little bit easier for you to see and for us to get in to drill it from underneath. So, Remember to handle these panels carefully. So, we've got the panel like that. And we're now going to hold it at the front like that and just press the back, again, just you're pointing down there. So with the front up hard against the wishbone tube and 
was a little bit cut out of there. We're going now to press the panel to the side of the body and where we've made the incision in the bottom there will be a slight bend in the panel where it changes direction. And I can see now that we need to trim some off the lower returned edge again. And again it's round about an inch, inch and a quarter. I'm going to mark it with a white marker so you can see it. And I'll take the panel off. So you can see we've just marked it just there. And we now need to cut that little piece off there. So it's in there. Oh, that's it, right. So that's pretty good, is it? Yeah. So we offer the panel back up again, tucking it around the bottom, tucking it in just there. And then we can see now, yes, it presses in like that. And the panel slightly changes in direction in the middle like that. So that's Yeah. So let it out. We've now got the panel laid in position and we know now, or at least I know, that the panel is going to fit. Now the body sides of the 2B have a lot of shape to them and the shape that the car should be is correct. Obviously both sides must be the same. So because of the size we've manufactured these panels, when the panel is screwed in you will find there is a bow to the panel and this is intentional so that it gives the car character and it doesn't have the slab sided look but you must be very careful how you get the bow and it must be a bow that is acceptable in so much that it isn't too great and yet it's not too weak that it will spring back in again so to start off this what might sound like a difficult um, operation we're going to start off by fastening the top of the panel directly onto the tube again with self-tapping screws. So I'm going to do that first and then we're going to do the bottom and then we'll work towards a very very difficult bit at the back. So I've screwed it to the top of the frame there pressing it in gently against the tube. Um, I put one, two, three, about half a dozen screws in there and then we've got it so that um, the bottom, I've bent the tag away, the temporary tag that holds the floor in position, I've bent that flat and we've got the side of the, the panel pressing against the tube, at least in the middle where it, uh, where it touches and then I'm going to get some vice grips and just um, vice grip the front corner that we can get out from the top in here. Yeah. So we're clamping that together with the vice grips. Right, so, and then we're going to get down and screw that panel in from underneath. Right, you'll notice that I'm wearing goggles and we're starting at the incision where we know the panel's hard up against there and we're going to start drilling just there.
you just bear with me, I'll just drill a couple more then out of the way. Then we'll do the tricky bit at the back. I've now put the screws in on the front part of the side panel up to the middle incision. Now that is relatively easily, they fitted quite, quite well. I've put about five in, obviously you'll need more towards the end of the job. We now come to the back, which is a little bit more tricky because now you'll see, it may worry you a little bit, that there is quite a gap between the floor and the side panel. So again, we need to push it in very gently and you'll see now that we need to push that edge up. So it's no longer flat, the side panel is actually bowing out, it's twisted at the top, but we still need to push that edge up till it touches the floor and then we need to put a screw in. So you need a little bit of help here and where we made the incision that is tucked under, it could be over but it's tucked under that and there's a slight bend in the side. So I'm going to put the goggles on again, I'm going to press the panelling with my knee like that and I'm going to drill a hole like so and get one screw in at least. So I've got that one screw there and although it's making a, the floor slightly bent there, at least I've got that edge up together. So we're going now to jet along that side and put half a dozen screws in very quickly. Right, that is the provisional screws underneath. We're now going to move to the top and at this stage now I've got to confess that nearly every time I think to myself this isn't going to work. So we come to the top and we can see, up you come cameraman, and we come to the top and we can see we've got the panel greatly distorted bellowing out and flaring out like that and basically this is what gives the the 2B its unique shape at the sides so we've got to now gently push that panel in starting from the front just there and working our way along just like that I can see straight away that all my fears are unfounded this is going to work so again with the help of my trusty vice grips We've got good quality ones and naff ones. And you do need the good quality ones when you're trying to grip this inch and a half tube. The sheet clamped in position with your vice grips, we're going to drill at the very, very top of the sheet, about a quarter of an inch from the edge. Put screws all the way along. You'll see that I've got the minimum of screws in this panel now um, and you can see we've got a lovely shape to that panel like that there. That is the shape it's supposed to have um, and we will put obviously drill more holes and then those screws will be substituted for pot rivets because there is a, a cap, a plastic cap goes on the top of that. Remember you need to handle these panels delicately at this stage be really really careful because we are looking to get a nice straight level panel without any ripples at all in it. It is quite solid where the curve is there while well, it's a little bit wobbly just there. Remember towards the end of your build you will put braces in from the inside of this panel to stiffen it up. You'll also be able to possibly spray some expanding foam inside. That, that, that helps it terrifically. But remember to handle it carefully and I really wouldn't advise welding the panel on at all because all you're going to do is get terrible um, buckling on the panel.
I'm going to carry on with the other side of the car. That's the driver's side. Putting in the tunnel, the foot panel, and then the body side. First of all, we'll start with the front tunnel section. I'm already cut a hole out of it and bent the bottom edge. And at this stage now, it's a good idea to put the speedometer cable in because it is difficult to get at later on. So we've got the original cable from the Ford Sierra and we're going to examine it for any damage to it, any severe kinks in it and we're going to pull out the inner cable, wipe it clean, wash it in petrol and lightly re-grease it and put it back in. Note that's a circlip that you took out, you've perhaps lost it, get a new one from a Ford agent. With your finger stuck up the speedometer end of the speedo cable to push the cable well in, push the square end into that little hole, make sure it's gone in. like so and then you need your circlip with some circlip pliers or like I've got a mini pair of snipe nose pliers and put the circlip in it's a good idea to make sure that groove is well cleared out cleaned out so that it goes in easily and the clip does actually go into the groove. That's done in like that, that's good. Just push it in, oops, it's sprung out. Right, that's, that is now firmly into that slot and we've cut the mouse hole in the side of the hole in the tunnel just slightly bigger in this instance and we're going to put a little bit of split rubber tube on so with a little bit of tube we're going to cut a piece off the size of the mouse hole which is about four inches, like so. And then we're going to cut down it, the long length of it. Being careful that you don't cut your fingers. That's it. And that's going to go onto that round there. So the sharp edge of the side panel doesn't cut the speedo cable that's going over there like that it's going over there like that then we carry on now and we screw that side panel down onto the floor as we did on the other side. This is the larger of the two feet panels. The two circular cuts are where the two side tubes go and the widest part is at the top. This is the tunnel side. So we now need to fold it, so we're going to fold it along there like that and then at the bottom along there and at the sides like that. We're going to try it in like that first and then we'll decide where we're going to fold it at the top. 
So back to the trusty folder machine that we used before. A little bit of angle bent over your end of your wife's bed. I'll just fold this now. Or do we have to? Okay. With the tunnel fitted in position, with it screwed in at the back, up to that incision there, we've now got the front floating and we can now offer up this foot panel that we bent as we showed you where the dotted lines were. So we're offering that up like that and we can see that that's looking quite good. It looks as though we could just take a little bit of a bigger bite out the top for perfection. Now worked out where the bottom needs to be, like that. We'll take the panel out and then we'll drill and put screws in along the bottom. With the bottom of the tunnel screwed in, we're going to offer up for the second time this panel. It goes into there. You can see that it fits quite well. We need to bend the top now. So the top will go underneath the plate there that holds the servo. So we need to spy there and it ran about an inch and a half from the top. So we'll go and put a fold in that. In fact, we'll just put a shallow fold in it because it means that we can adjust it if necessary. So we'll just bend it round there like that. It means we can bend that up. It's not quite so precise, but remember, this is going to have to come out at some future time to cut the hole in for the steering and obviously what will happen, I've got to trim this in the future kicks that this panel will be a little bit more precise and hopefully that future builders won't have quite so much work to do to this panel but there is the material there to go at. Those of you who've got a little bit more time might even want to make one out of cardboard to start with. That's just going to go around that tube there. tried this in I can see now that I really should have bent that the other way so it's a good job we didn't put a, a definite fold in it so we're going to bend it back the other way so that means that all the folds are now going the same way this corner
Right, that is that panel in the position where it's going to be when it's finally on the car. So we will just put a couple of screws in it so that it's held in position. Right, that's four screws in holding that panel in there. That'll do um, temporarily at least. Now, I'm going to fit the exhaust to the car, at least provisionally. We've put the original Pinto manifold on and um, make sure when you do it that you put new gaskets between the block and the manifold and you replace any studs that snapped off and at least you run your nuts up and down the studs to make sure it goes on easily. So we now come to put the exhaust on. Also make sure that you've got the three studs free. We've now got the exhaust in position where it will go. What we need to do now is to record where the hole in the side is going to be. So with some masking tape, we're going to pull that strip down like that. And then we can see where it falls just there, like that. A bit more at the bottom so it doesn't come on fastened. More at the top like that. And then we need to record where the top of the hole would be. Like so, and then the bottom like that. Now the reason we're doing this is that when I'm thinking about yesterday when we put the other side on, we had, remember we had to trim the panel just there and a little bit off the back. And remember now we've done this simply because it gives you a little bit of movement with the panel backward and forward so that you get the exhaust hole exactly in the middle where the exhaust comes out. So what will happen now is I'll remove the exhaust, leave the temporary hole just there so that when we put the new panel on, this the offside panel, we can line the panel up with that hole. So we know that when the exhaust comes through the side of the car then it's coming through the hole as it is. We haven't got to trim the hole anymore. Right, we've now taken the exhaust off, off and it's decided that on this foot panel the fold that goes on the outside edge instead of it pointing forward we really should have pointed it backward. So we're going to take that panel off and we're going to put that fold in, reverse that fold so it goes backward. Okay. Right, I'm just straightening out this edge now to rectify the mistake that uh, we've made. The mistake that I've made. Now we've got that going. In the other direction.
Right, we've now got the fold going backwards and we've got the panel screwed back in and now we're going to repair this masking tape hole that we've had to rip apart to get to it. So we're repairing that back up again, like so, and then like that in the middle. Now, prior to offering the panel up, we're going to um, just tap this, the floor is protruding a little bit there. We're going to tap that tap on that. from the change in direction to the back, we'll leave that sticking out, all right? Same as the other side, we put that up to there, put it over the top, got that tightness there, and we can see that the other side does need the same amount, the inch taken off just there. We glance at the back, and it's pretty much the same, it needs another inch and a half taken off at the back. So that is, um, that's good, both sides are the same. We look at the hole, and the hole, my camera person has just said that it's perfect, and it really is absolutely spot on. You can see that when the exhaust comes through there, it'll be totally central in the hole. Obviously, if we had got it so that it wasn't central, then we would take a, a little piece out of there instead of it just here. So that was the idea of leaving the panel slightly oversized so we could get that spot on. But we can see that with that, in this car at least, that butted up to there, the hole, the hole is totally in the centre, so we'll take a little bit out of there. Right, I'm putting the panel on now. My camera person here tells me that it looks as if it was fixed, that exhaust hole. I can assure you, it wasn't fixed. It was dead genuine, that's how it felt. So we've got that on there like that, that's good. And we're on the same process now, that's going to clear the back. We're on the same process of screwing it down, at least provisionally. Okay. Right, we've got the panel screwed in the middle, four screws and a couple underneath up to the middle. And now again, we've got the process where we're going to bend it in very carefully like that for it to change direction like that. And that's it hard up against that. So we're going to fasten the bottom in now push it in and screw it up at the bottom like that. Right, we've now got the screws screwed underneath that. I'll just remind you that it means that the floor isn't level underneath it does bend away with the sides being slightly lower than the actual floor itself because of the way we're bending the panel. Made a slight alteration to this side whereas we've told you to, to drop directly down from that incision there and put your cut um, underneath it. We've moved it in this instance inch, one inch further towards the front of the car makes a slight difference when you're forming this panel. So again now, we're at the stage now where we're going to grip the top of this with the grips, but we're going to have to handle this panel very carefully, very delicately, and we're going to form it in. So remember, very carefully, so not put any dings in the side, we're pressing this panel in like that. This panel is actually got better than the one on the other side. That's formed it in like that. And then we're going to grip it with the grips at the top, like so. So 
that's got the panel gripped at the top and it's a real nice shape without any dings in the side. We're now going to drill that and screw it first and pop rivet it after. You've got to be careful because you can get some little dings in the side where you force the panel out. So you've really got to be very careful. If you do get any, you'll see little half moon shaped things, then press the panel out from behind and then with a hammer, just gently on the apex of the ding, just tap it very, very gently and it will come out. Eventually you may need to put some kind of former behind it to stiffen up the panel a bit, but that's got quite good shape to it. Um, I'd like to see it just a little bit more formed out, but no, that's got quite acceptable shape. I still wasn't altogether happy with the shape of the side. I wanted more shape to the side, so I've taken the grips off again. I've drilled one hole in the, in the centre of the tube, and I'm putting a self-tapping screw in that hole like that. Nearly all the way in. And then what I'm going to do now, I'm going to just spring this panel out. So that it goes like that. And that does give me more shape, so I'm a little bit happier with that. More shape to the side. Remember, both sides have got to be the same. We're back to the vice grips again. We're gripping that up. That's given us more shape to the side, but looking at it, there's too much shape. So we're going to put another hole just above it, an eighth of an inch. So, and take that first screw out. And that's probably more acceptable. Put the grips on it now. Continue to screw that all the way along. Ready? That is a nose cone infill panel, and that, as the name suggests, fits into the front of the panel just there. Goes round the rack, and there is provision to trim it slightly, so we'll just take a little bit off round this tube just there. Just a small amount. Yeah, that fits better. Um, Again, a little bit more, and then that mouse hole there will be directly in the middle of the rack. Okay, that's pretty good, that is. And we'll go around the back now, around that way, and holding it in position like that, we'll scribe along the top like that. And we'll put a fold 90 degrees in the top of that. Side. We're now going to drill it and put some screws in the top and mark where they're going to go. A couple of screws in the top there and we're also going to put some screws in the side. So as soon as we're not drilling into a wobbly panel, we'll drill this panel before we fasten it up. Okay? And we can see we also will put one screw there and one just there. So we'll drill all those holes while it's flat on the deck. Right, with all the keyholes drilled first, we'll put the panel back on. 
like so and then we fasten it onto the car right we've now got that panel in position you'll see we've got two screws at the top couple of screws round the bottom of the mouse hole then a neat row of five screws that join the panel together um, we haven't done anything at the front yet we're leaving our options open at the front we could form that round the corner or depending on how the nose cone falls we may leave it as it is but we'll just see to that in a little while we're going now to fit this panel on here which is an infill panel I forget what we called it in your literature that goes there and fills in that gap there so it's the same kind of thing put it there in position so it's nice and equal between the, the holes and then um, you can mark it from behind where you're going to fold it like that fold it at 90 degrees and then you can fasten it on with a couple of screws at the top and two more at the bottom while we're in this position now we're now going to uh, oh yes what I'm going to say yeah all these screws that we've got here we put self-tapping screws in. Now, you could leave them as self-tapping screws or you could um, put pop rivets, but I would like to see that that panel is detachable in the future for various jobs you've got to do. Obviously, obviously those of you who want to make a supersonic job, then you could put little 2BA chrome plated or stainless steel socket screws in um, and make a feature of that panel at the front, but it will be painted this, all the same colour it will all blend in quite well and you won't see the joins in all these panels um, once it's painted particularly if you paint the screws and the pot rivets as well end of that off there so that it's not a sharp corner and it just finishes it off neatly there is a rail to go across the front of here yet for the bonnet to fasten on to so remember that panel will have to come off again remember don't weld it yet or don't weld it at all you recognise that, that is the piece you've taken out of your floor for where the gearbox fitted. We're now going to fit that on top of the front section of the tunnel directly above the mechanical gearbox. So I've laid that on top like that and I'm going to mark it now where we've got to fold it. So we can see that we're going to need a fold just there, there there and that one is about an inch from the edge just there but I would say before we do that we ought to have fitted that uh, foot panel so before you commit yourself to this top make sure that the foot panel is fitted but for this exercise we'll fit this now so we'll take it off and then we've got a little bit of material here that we don't want at this end we'll just snip that off and then we'll, uh, we'll save it because we, we need to fill in a few little bits here and there. So don't throw anything away. That's the operative word. Let's go and bend this now and I'll be back in a second. With two returns on that, that's ready to go in now. So that just snaps on top like so. And then you want some screws, self tapping screws in the side like that. You will need to make another plate that boxes the end of that in just there and a little bit at the front of this, at the back of this I should say, to fill in that space there because there is a void there. Once you've got your tunnel top there, there's still an inch gap so even that bit there would, would, would go in and fit in just there like that. And again, make this detachable so that you can easily whip your bonnet off and then when you've got funny noises coming from your gearbox, you've lost some of the gears, take the top off undo the one two three six eight ten bolts in the top up with the top of the gearbox and see all the bits and pieces and all the broken cogs and ball bearings all in there and then what whilst we've done work to the car in the last couple of days we've noticed that the rear end of the car has been too low consequently we need to adjust the spring seats so at this stage now they are about four inches into the tubes so that they're only in one inch so we tap them out
And then we're going to take the springs back in the holders. And then we carefully let the car back down again. Just watch your fingers if you're doing this. You could really do with two people doing it so you don't get your fingers caught. Now, that does provisionally look better. And they've already pushed back in there, so we will need to go back to where we were, jack it back up, tap them back down to the hinge that we said. then we'll need to just put the clamp on them to stop them moving. If it works, then we'll uh, drill and bolt it. So with those spring seats repositioned again, we've now got from the weld mark on them at first and strut to the bottom of the roll bar tube about four inches now. And you can see that gives us a higher a higher um, amount of clearance at the back, but obviously once the car is complete, the front suspension in on it will go down. So that's that. Okay. Now, hang on, if you notice when the suspension was right down, that that part of the bodywork was catching on the tyre. So it looks like I'll be asking you to trim. That much away there, so in the event of the suspension bottoming, then it won't catch on the bodywork. But we'll see when we put the rear wing on how much we can afford to trim away there. But it looks like you want to bite out of there about an inch and a half. We're coming now to fit the rack. Now, although we're fitting it now on this relatively bare chassis, you will need to have in position your steering column. That's the one from the donor vehicle. And it'll need to be in more or less the right place with the steering column bushing and the um, steering column bush bracket with the triangular end of the Ford Sierra shaft poking through the hole in the foot panel. Now just remember that make sure you've got this in the right position because this triangular end is telescopic it does move up and down inside the steering column in the event of an accident. And often when people take them out of the donor vehicle, they drop them on the floor and it pushes up inside. We do get reports of people saying that the steering column is too short. It will pull out as well, depending on the position that you want to fit your steering column. So first of all, we've got to make sure that it hasn't collapsed inside. You've got plenty coming through the firewall, the footwell panel. And imagine there should be two or three inches coming through. With that coming through, that then tells you exactly how long your steering shaft needs to be. Now, we've recently upgraded the system now for the steering racks and the steering column. And steering shaft I should say and everybody now gets this square ended shaft there isn't a join in the middle anymore as in the old days and there's all these things that push erode our profit away and make it necessary for us to put the price of the kicks up so we are battling with that at the moment trying to keep the price static but with all these improvements is making it difficult so even if you've got a plus pack your steering shaft will still be the same as that with the square end. There is a hole in the square end and the hole in the end is precisely that of the diameter of this original Ford Sierra steering shaft. And you'll recognise it, it's the same as you have on your car because it has the clamp on the end, that the triangular clamp that clamps on the end of the steering column. We have seen different ones on various different cars, but they, they all are more or less the same as this. 
Um, obviously, if yours wasn't the same, then we advise you to go to the breaker's yard and get one like this. This coupling at the end, which is always troublesome, this rubber coupling, that is cut off totally and disregarded. You don't need that at all now. If you were to measure precisely the diameter of that shaft, you would find that it was exactly the same as the internal diameter of that hole. So therefore, when you've cut the end off there, it will push into that hole, it'll hammer into the hole quite tight. But that's important, because you do have to do a mathematical calculation now. It does mean to say that what you have to do is to, um, with your steering column in position, and the amount of material coming out of the bottom footwell panel, it means then you've got to calculate how long you need to cut this shaft so that you can hammer it into the end of that and clamp it in. So you don't get two goes at this, so it means you've got to really put the rack in and take it out and put it in again and take it out again and put the column in and take it out. Do it several times so you know what, how long it needs to be. So you need to poke something down there, a depth gauge, to work out how deep that hole is. Looks like two inches to me. So you know that when you've got that in there, you're going to lose two inches. So it works pretty simple. We've precisely drilled this square block. And we've drilled it so that when we drilled it, the drill encroached in the aperture. So it means that um, once you've hammered that inside there and you've got to the bottom of the hole once you re-drill that again with your 8 mil hole drill sorry it means that you're going to take a bite out of the side of that shaft so that when you do put your your locking bolt back through it then it will be securely held in not only by the the pinchness of the clamp because you can see that that's split not only by the pinchness of the, of the clamp, but also the fact that you've got a bite out of the round shaft that will mean that it's impossible for it to turn. So if you just digest what I've said carefully before you embark on this, then you'll know what you've got to do. You'll get your measurements precise. We carry on now, and we, you'll need to clean this, sorry, you'll need to clean this up. So we recommend that you wire brush it up and you clean it well and you paint it well with the exception of the part that you're going to push into that square block. Now, that, this universal joint here does very little work at all. We haven't yet found one that's been worn. But what we have found is that it may not be worn, but it may be stiff on one of the planes. So this one's a perfect one. You can see that both planes are okay. You may find that in the action in your car that it only moved on one of those planes, not both, and one could be semi seized up. So if you just put it in the vise, penetration oil, and move it backward and forward, then it's pretty definite you'll free it off. You, you would lose your self um, centering ability of the steering. car. Now, I don't want you to take this universal joint off the shaft at this end, simply because that we've pressed it on. It is a, quite a tight interference fit, and we've pressed that on, so I'd rather you didn't take that off. So you can put it on in one go like this. So if you just watch carefully, we push that in there. that and take that up there we bring that back and feed that up into there bring it across like that and it goes like so we might have got it right first time but uh, that's in we now, this is held in with two U-bolts, a large and a small U-bolt. So 
the holes are already pierced in the chassis. You may need to clean them out a little bit first. That goes in there. You've got spaces, a sort of spaces in the kit above the holes. I've now gently tapped the two U-bolts in place. And if we look now, we've got the, the pinion of the rack actually resting on the chassis. We need to pack that up so it isn't being forced down onto the chassis. So we're going to use an assortment of spacers. These you get in your kit. You may have to trim them, you may have to supplement them. But basically, on the end with the large U-bolt, we're looking to put, at this stage, two spacers, and we're going to put them in across the U-bolt. Lift that up and we put them in across the U-bolt. And that looks as though that's going to lift the rack up so that the pinion is just off the chassis. At the other end, we're going to, we, we know we're going to need two more spacers equally as thick, and we're going to have to supplement them, possibly with two thin ones. So we're now going to put those in the opposite way around so that height and without measuring it we're not far off. So in this case we've got the spacers long ways on instead of across the way just here and we can see that we've got the, the, the pinion just missing the chassis and we've got um, the height in between there looks okay, that doesn't need checking. You'll notice then when we do tighten these up, just tap them down. So we're putting washers underneath and 10mm um, nuts underneath and we'll tighten them up. Then we may tighten this end quite tight without any problem at all as it's on a cast metal clamp and pull that up really tight and obviously because of the nature of the two recesses in that, that stops the, the rack moving from side to side. The other end um, is um, a little bit more susceptible to it being crushed. So we mustn't pull these up too tight at all. We must just look at that very carefully. Don't over tighten them because you, you'll squash the tube. Then I've got, of course, these nuts want supplementing um, with either lock nuts or um, some kind of locking device. So that's the rack in position. And now we know that we've, we know what length to put the other end in. So that can be tapped in and then fed onto that clamp. And in this, in this case now, it gives you a good clearance between your alternator, between this tube, and obviously against your manifold pipes. Just to come to the other end, um, where the rack goes into the um, drop arm, remember in this instance that it is going from the opposite side of the drop arm, which means that the taper is the other way around. Now this works perfectly well. What you will find, make sure you take these plastic caps off. You will. So you'll find that because you're using these upside down, that the taper is upside down, that you will need to just pop a drill in there, a 10 mil drill, and just wobble it around in a hole slightly to make a slight taper for that track rod end to go in. And it does work perfectly well. You may need to supplement it with a washer at the bottom to, um, to pull it up very tight. Remember, with your nylon locking nuts, that if you find that you've got problems that they start to spin before the taper takes effect and grips it, then you can get around that quite easily by putting several washers temporarily before the nut so that the nut does its work in pulling it down tight before you reach the nylonness of the nut. Obviously, once it's clamped in tight, then you take the nut off, take the washers off, or take the majority of them off, and then put the nut back on again. Now I'm going to start on the bonnet. Now, this bonnet operation goes through two or three different phases. 
and we do use different cars and different bonnets throughout it. We do use some footage from some old video. But we're starting off now with this bonnet, which is a relatively current bonnet. We've chosen to use a mild steel one because it does show up better on the video than the stainless one with all the refre reflections. And we've just coated this with uh, red oxide on the inside so that you can see it clear. So I'll just carry on with this now. And we're making a start with reforming this corner. You'll see that the corners of the bonnet has got a slight incision in it. We need to just nick that on the very edge, on an eighth thin like that. Because now we need to reform that corner. And having nicked that little bit like that, we do need to bend it out and straighten it out. So with some pliers or some vice grips, we're just going to bend that out like that. And then we need to tap it flat on a metal block. Well, I've conveniently got that metal block, a little bit of an anvil thing. So you need to find something similar. So with that like that, we get the hammer and we tap that flat. strengthener into the corner so in your kit you'll get this triangular piece of metal like that and that goes into that corner like that so we're going to trap that in so we're going to put a little bit of sealer on it some structural sealer um, there's lots of these on the market now there's one that's used extensively by DI wires sold in wicks and home base and places like that called liquid nails that appears to be quite good. But this is a structural sealer, Seekerflex, and that now is going to be stuck on there like so. And then to hold it in place, we're going to put some masking tape. Now surprisingly this masking tape is quite strong and it will hold it in place while we do it. That's got that like that, and now what we really need to do is to flatten that corner over Flatten that corner over Like that. We've got to be careful that we're not going to dent the bonnet, it's particularly important if you're building a stainless steel car you don't dent it like so that's quite good so that's the corner reinforced I'm going to do the same to the other side along the inner edge of this bonnet along the return lip every four inches apart I'm drilling an eighth pilot hole first and I'm drilling exactly in the middle of the three quarter inch return ledge. I'm also drilling with my brand new Power Devil drill which I've just bought from B&Q for sorry, Sainsbury's home base for $7.99. Can you imagine an electric drill? It goes forward and backwards and it's got a hammer for $7.99. bonnet together so we can then put a quarter inch drill or a six mil drill in the machine and um, drill through the one hole and project it to the other. It is really really important that you ensure that the bonnet is level underneath and that you've got it level at the end. So we'll start off from the front, 
So if there is any slight discrepancy in the length of the two bonnets, um, it's a front that's important. So we've got to make sure that, the, that they are level, and I can see that there isn't a problem. We can clamp that together with these vice grips, like so. And we'll do the back end. Making sure it's level. That's good. One set in the middle. And then, just for good measure, because we've got loads and loads of things in this bag, we'll put some more on. that and like that. And then we'll turn the bonnet over just to double check to make sure that it is flush and yes it is flush along there that's okay so we put it back down and then we whiz through these holes but remember as we're drilling always as always we're drilling holes like this you only drill one hole and then you put a nut and bolt in. So we're going to put the nut and bolt in now. So So this is a Phillips set the screw here and um, you notice that we've got my brand new spanner nil my brand new spanner ratchet spanner So we'll put one in the other end now. Just watch that when you're drilling this. If you've got a bigger drill, the chuck doesn't crash in and damage the bonnet. Using six mil nuts and bolts here. Remember, it may have been a good idea in the case of a mild steel bonnet to have primed this edge before you started because it's, it's in cavities like this that rust could start. So, we are going to fill it eventually with a mastic sealer. But a coat of primer in there would have been a good idea. It just run a sharp edge along the corner and take the strip of plastic off before you bolt it together. It's, it's always a job to get it off afterwards. Once it's trapped in there, you finished up with a ragged edge. Indentation in there when you tighten it up. Do you want to do this? I'm just going to tighten all these screws up, and then that will be, and then the bonnet will be together. That's the bonnet bolted together. Take the clamps off and we'll look at it from underneath just to make sure that we have got it level. So 
what happens now, we'll look at it from underneath. We've just got to make sure that it is level across there. And I can see that because of a slight difference in the folds, it is not quite level. So all we're going to do is to get the bonnet like this and to give it a big hug together like that. And now it's level like that. You see across the top that it's level. If it was bowing the other way, if it was convex, then we would just squeeze it the other way. So we've got the bonnet together like that. Just one final thing to do to the bonnet, and that's to fit a strip on the back. Now, we're due to put the price of kits up at any minute. And when we do put the price of kits up, then you'll get the strip in the kit. But it's little things like this that I'm afraid that mean we've got to put the price up. We can't hold it very much longer. So the people that bought the kits at the new price, they will get this strip. If you don't get it in your kit, then you'll have to make one yourself. So that snaps on the back, you see it's just a piece of metal that's folded in half around about 32 inches long and that's, we ought to really first of all measure it to get, to get it in the middle because often these things that once you've got them on you can't get them off again. So that's 32 and a half, so we'll mark it at 16 and a quarter. So that goes 16 and a quarter just there and it snaps on on the back edge and it does stiffen the bonnet up. Right, so we just tap it on gently. If it was certain this was staying on for keeps, then we would have squirted some of the structural sealer in. To the demist events like that and it stiffens up the back of the bonnet and it doesn't need a lot more than that than some structural sealer when you put your demist vents on the demist vents go over the top and the common screws will hold it all together so that then is the bonnet complete um, and it's now ready to go onto the car this is this bonnet complete we're now going to fit a bonnet onto a car. Now, we have used some old footage here from um, an older video, and you will see that the bonnet is clearly different. Um, in addition to that, uh, it is different because it's longer, it's had the shorter nose cone. In addition to that, we've also um, using a stainless steel bonnet, uh, which has got the white plastic covering on. So that may confuse you a little bit, but the footage is quite good. I've looked at it already, and it is worth using. We're now going to try, offer up the bonnet, see what it's like. Just so we get the bonnet height right, we're going to put a little piece of wood on top of the engine like that, uh, so that the bonnet doesn't sit too low. Right, look at me now. Um. So we've got the bonnet, we're going to try on. Now remember, if this bonnet's not quite the right shape, if it's dipping in in the middle where the seam is, or it's standing too high where the seam is, you can gently just shape it like that by just bending it like that and you'll get some shape into it. Like. So we come to offer it up now and we plonk it onto the back rail gently like so and onto the body sides and we're looking for it to overhang at the back around about an inch. So we're squaring it up like that and sitting on top of that with a piece of wood on top of the engine and that's looking pretty good there at the front and at the back we've got yeah about an inch so as we press it down to the side that's bringing it down nicely onto the side of the body so the next thing we've got to do is to fix this in position pretty definite where it's going to go and put the hinge bolts in so now I'm going to jiggle this around to make sure we've got the correct amount sticking out the back for the overlap, we need a bit of an overhang on it to put the snap-on finisher on and for it to hood the dashboard and it's got the same both sides. So I'm going to get some clamps and clamp it down at the side and um, get ready to drill it. Okay. So you can see the block of wood that's supporting or temporarily supporting the centre of the bonnet of the oil filler hole. You can see the clamp 
loops that we've got holding the bonnet in position at the front. As we come round the back, we'll see some more of these clamps. Okay. So to hold in the back of the bonnet down, you can see that we've got the bonnet sticking out right about an inch from the tube there. That's so the dashboard will fit in and we can snap on the uh, edge finisher which comes from the door aperture of your Ford Sierra. We look at the bonnet square on from the side. Okay. You can see we've got a nice gap all the way along with the exception at the front and it looks like we're going to have to take off that nose cone infill panel and tip it down at the front. You can see we've got too big a gap there, it's tight there. So that'll have to be rotated clockwise slightly. And also we think it was a little bit of a mistake to take that bite out of there. We shouldn't have taken that out. So that will also bring that panel further forward. As you know, the bonnet is hinged at this back pointed corner with one long 10 mil bolt. We're now going to drill a hole for that bolt, but we're going to use only an eighth pilot hole to start with, simply because we'll put a small self tapping screw in to see if it works before we commit ourselves to a 10 mil hole. So I'm going to drill from behind because that is the perfect position for this bolt, and we won't be able to accurately do that from the face side. So we know we need to be a spy down about an inch from the bottom of the bonnet, which would mean that the drill would be there and it would need to come right through the centre of the tube. So we'll drill from this side. So we'll start off just there, straight through with an eighth drill. got the hole drilled through two sides of the tube and I'll come into the bonnet now. So I'm going to put a block of wood there to support the bonnet. Don't put your knee there because you could drill into your knee. So I'm drilling through. That's right, so let's see I'm drilling through. I'm right the way through the lock now and now I'm going to put in temporarily a self-tapping screw to hold it in position while I go round the other side and carry out the identical exercise to the other side but obviously this time I'm going to drill through, through the tube, through both sides of the tube, one side. Hold the wood there. Right the way through. And I'm going to put a self-tapping screw in. Take all the clamps off and hopefully that will be the bonnet hinging. If it hinges okay, then we can go on and substitute these self-tapping screws for a proper thick 10 mil bolts. We now have the acid test. We've got the two screws in, and we're gonna gently lift the bonnet up like that. And yes, it looks like it's going to You've just got to watch that these corners just here don't dig into the side or damage them or to curl under. So I'll just leave it for the photographer, the video person, just to shout out if they do start for anything strange. I'll watch the other side. So we're lifting it up. And what's happening? Are they splaying out or? Yep, yeah, that's it. So it's only gone up so far. It could do with lifting a little bit higher. 
We'll look to see why it's only lifting so far, but yes, that, that's pretty good, that is. So we'll pop it back down again now. We'll take one screw out, then the other screw, and we'll put large nuts and bolts through. The technical camera operator is telling me that it was just catching on that little bit there, so what we'll do, once we've put the nut and bolt in, we'll just planish that back a little bit and see if we can um, solve that problem. I'm now going to take that screw out, drill a hole right the way through, an 8mm hole, put a roof fin bolt through the hole, I'm going to put a couple of washers to space off, space it off to try to get over that problem we've got where it's catching. And I'm also just going to tap that very gently. And I'm pretty certain that could just do the trick. So we'll whiz that out, like so. We drill through with the 8mm drill through that lot. Remember there's four thickness in the metal there now. Well. Okay, we get the roofing bolt now, which we've got in my pocket conveniently. Roofing bolt. Two washers. Through there like that. Two washers in between the spaces. Through the hole. Remember, if nobody else says thinks something's good, and you can say yourself. Go around the other side, do the same thing to the other side. So, we've got the bolts in, we've got the nuts on, two washers in between there, we've tapped that down, and we'll just try the bonnet now. Yep, yeah, that's perfect this time. It opens right up. That's about the maximum you can go with it. But that's plenty, plenty room in here to do all the work and everything like that. Down it goes. So, yep, yeah, we're somewhere with this one. Um, possibly we could take just one of those washers out there so there's just one, or you might get them both out. That's just sound a little bit proud, but it will go in a little bit if necessary. So, that's the bonnet, uh, the first stage of the bonnet complete. And the bonnet initially with the nose cone. Now, although this operation we're using a full nose cone for the stainless steel cars, and it will be a stainless steel um, bonnet we'll use, the procedure is just the same. We're going to start by taking out the centre of the nose cone. Um, you need really to offer up your radiator grill that has bent tags on it to work out exactly how much material you need to leave on that inner lip. On these full nose cones there's a recess already in it, so it makes it a little bit easier because you're cutting just inside the recess. So you'll see the recess all the way around there like that, so it is that that you need to cut out. But before you start, if you get your grill, pop your grill in, make sure that the four legs have got material to go into. So with the um, with knowing how much you're going to cut out of the nose cone, you're going to then um, make a start, drill some holes, and then cut it out with, a, with an ordinary hacksaw blade. Before I do that, I'll just move on to one other item area of the nose cone. If we look carefully, regardless of where the nose cone finishes down there, you'll see there is a ridge, quite a definite ridge. We need to mark exactly where that ridge comes to the end of there, like that. And that is the point that we're interested in just there. The same on this side. 
looking along there, that is the key point just there. We need to measure exactly from one side to the other. And whatever the measurement is, or wherever you decide that point is, obviously it's equal on both sides, I make it 32 and a half. So what I'm interested in is a mark which is 16 and a quarter. Now this is really important that you get, you find the centre of this. So we're trying to find the centre of those two white marks and that's it at 16 and a quarter, just there like that. So that's quite important, you've got that mark because that mark just there is what we're going to eventually line up with the centre of your bonnet, that, that seam in the middle of your bonnet, you're lining it up with that. So we're moving now, again, back to the nose cone like that, and we're going to start off by just drilling a couple of holes, or a row of holes, just slightly above the, the line like that. Three holes like that, put the drill in, and what we drill so that it gives you a slot like that. And then with an ordinary hacksaw blade, something like a 24 or 32 teeth two hacksaw blade, you're going to pop that in the hole and you're going to cut, start to cut out this centre out of the nose cone. Now what will happen is that you'll carry on like that, cutting straight forward until you start to come to the corner. And when you come to the corner, as I'm doing now, then you'll twist the blade. If you can see that I'm twisting the blade, you'll put a twist on the blade like that. And you'll still keep on cutting like that, but with a twist. And you'll find that that will naturally go round the corner like that. So it'll take you five or ten minutes to do it. Obviously, if you find you've got a problem and you can't quite master this twisting in the corner, then if you just get your drill and just on the corners, you can chain drill the holes like that, then a little bit of sandpaper and sand it out. This is the nose cone with the centre cut out. My technical uh, friend here has just pointed out that it may be better if they did it with the jigsaw. Don't do it with the jigsaw because the jigsaw won't sit fat, flat on that face. Do it the way I've showed you. Come to drill the bonnet and we've put a strip of masking tape all the way around the front edge of the bonnet which is 18 millimeter from the edge of the bonnet exactly 18 millimeter all the way around and then starting from the center we've marked it at exactly an inch intervals so that's half an inch first and then an inch an inch an inch and then from the center again half an inch an inch an inch an inch all the way around so we've marked that um, at uh, one inch. And what we're going to do now is very, very carefully with a brand new eighth drill go round and drill all those holes very, very carefully. You may need someone to hold a block of wood underneath it um, while you do it um, just to give you a little bit of support. So a block of wood, a block of wood under the bonnet and then carefully drill the hole like that and all the way around so that you all the way around so you've drilled all the holes exactly an inch. Stop. That's it. Good job this time. None of the holes have wandered. They're all straightforward like that. Now the next thing to do is to offer up the nose cone. the nose cone and we'll put it into the bonnet aperture cut.
in your kit you receive some plastic finisher that snaps on the edge of the bonnet. So you now need to snap this finisher onto the edge of the bonnet like so and push it well on. Sometimes you use a little bit of coaxing to get it on. That's pushed all the way along there like that. I've had this on once so it's gone on relatively easily. So that is pushed on like so. And once it's on, make sure it's level with the sides like that. Turn it off so it is level. And you'll see that that then gives you around about a quarter of an inch before the, um, the holes. So that it doesn't slip off in, during the next operation. It's a good idea to get masking tape and to tape it on. So you can put the masking tape right up to the start of the holes, keeping the chrome and plastic strip pushed well on like that. So you're pushing that well on, and that's going to stay on nearly all the time until you've finished this operation, like so. See now that I've offered this nose cone up into the bonnet. And the key thing is that we've lined up those two centre marks. Now, to be honest, you, you, you won't get the nose cone and the bonnet to, to fit snug together. It just doesn't happen. We have to screw it up to pull it together so that it does fit well. And it will fit well, even though we've got these relatively big gaps in these corners. So, I'm going to start off by putting at least one screw in the centre to secure it and then we'll work way along. Come on. See that we're aiming to get the the strip, the edge of the strip. Um, I'll just pull it up a little bit just so you can see it, just so you can see what we're talking about. You're looking to get the edge of the strip, the shiny part of the strip, nicely into the corner of that recess on the nose cone. So you can see it just there. We're looking to get that nicely into the corner. And before you put any more screws in at all, you've really got to check that on both sides we've got the edge of that chrome strip up into the corner. Because if you start from the middle and work your way out, as you go along, then um, a, a, a sixty-fourth of an inch there will give you a quarter inch wrong at the other side. So you can see that we've got that first screw, and what I'm going to do now is carry along, carry on drilling into the fiberglass with an eighth drill and put these self-tapping screws in. And I'm going to go all the way along, I'm going to do one, one side, then the other side, then swap and go from side to side all the way along there. Nicely pulling the fiberglass and the stainless steel together. Now, the slight problem is that we cannot over tighten these screws because they won't bite very well into the fiberglass so if you keep just twisting you'll just strip them so we're only doing it gently when we get to the corners when we're looking to pull up more material then we'll be putting something behind that to give a little bit more strength in your kit you'll find various small pieces of off cuts and scrap particularly in the centre of the seat back panel you need to cut two small strips, something like this, that you'll be able to now put behind the nose cone to give it more support where you're trying to pull up this difficult corner. So you need to form this, so just bend it so that it's the shape of the bonnet like that, and then you'll need something to hold it for you underneath the fiberglass. So when you drill through, you're drilling through the metal as well, and then your screws, instead of pulling up into the fiberglass, you won't really pull up, they're now pulling up, up into the metal, and it's giving it the, the, the maximum support. So you need someone to hold that underneath, make sure they hold it with a uh, block of wood, you don't want them to you know, drill into the finger. So that goes underneath now, we're continuing all the way around to pull that up together. We've now got the plate in, and we've started the first screw off, but in order to make it easier, we're using longer self-tapping screws now to pull up the, the material, um, because we won't reach with the shorter ones 
you've still got to be a little bit careful that when you're screwing this in, that the nose cone is actually being pulled towards a stainless bonnet and not the other way around, that you're deforming the bonnet down to the nose cone. So you can see that we've reached that now, we've got a longer screw, and that is now pulling it up nicely like that, that's great. You can see, so we can see it's just coming down, super. And we're going to move to the other side so we're doing both things equal and we're still looking to make sure that the uh, it's fitted into that corner of the nose cone You can see now that these corners are coming really nice now and that's pulling in. I think the fiberglass is pulling into the stainless and the stainless is giving a little bit as well. So that's getting the corner lined up nicely. Okay. Pulling in. Remember don't still over tighten them. Now what happens now is that these screws are only temporary and we will now I'll, I'll just draw that just because it we keep screwing it remember don't put any more than one screw in without drilling a hole. Don't drill three or four holes and try to put the screw in. Put a screw in, drill a hole and then do the next screw and that pulls up nicely. Remember that towards the end of the build you'll take each screw out individually and replace it neatly with a pot rivet and then take another screw out replace it with a pot rivet making sure it pulls it up together tightly. We'll look underneath this now and you will see that we've fixed in a bracer across the bonnet before we started this job to hold the bonnet in position. So I'll lift the bonnet up now and you'll see that bracer that went in before we started the nose cone. You'll see that that has miraculously pulled together there with a nice gap. You'll see the plastic strip is in there. If we take that masking tape off, you see that's trapped in there nicely. We've got a slight difference here, that half inch gap. Don't worry about that because the nose cone will go into that, that's normal. As we look underneath here now, as we look underneath the bonnet, we'll see first of all the tube are referred to to hold the bonnet, stainless steel bonnet together. This is an ordinary bit of um, round tube. It's cranked slightly and the ends are squashed and bent at 90 degrees and bolted onto the edge of the bonnet. That stiffens the bonnet up considerably. You'll see when that comes down, it just clears the cam cover and the top of the top hose but more importantly you'll see all the screws that have pulled through there pulled it up tight and you'll see the longer screws in the corner and the important strengthening plates underneath the corner I can't see them, can you move this stay? Right yes, So you'll see the screws, the way they've pulled through and pulled the GRP up to the stainless steel and you'll see we've helped in the corners by having that little strengthening strip and you'll see those important longer self-tapping screws um, that pull it up and support the GRP and as I said earlier what will happen is that one by one we'll remove the screws and put a neat pot rivet in. We're now going to take out this temporary stay and lower the bonnet down, you'll see that it comes down. Just remember, you must make sure there's nothing on top of the engine or on top of the battery at any time when you're working on your Robin Hood, as you put a dint in the bonnet, the bonnet comes down nicely like that and it just shuts down properly like that. The nose can you
and the bonnet closes nicely like that. The nose cone just misses the chassis tube at the front, nice and square. We're now going to move to the nose cone infill panels just here to fill this void. We've already covered earlier the nose cone infill panels on the mild steel car and we're going to fit them to this. This is virtually the same process, but as we shut the bonnet down, we need to look at the point where the bonnet, or the nose cone, nearly touches the chassis at the front, where it does touch, just there. So we're going to put this nose cone infill panel on, but we're going to trim it away at the point that it's going to protrude too far out. So which is on that bottom corner. So I'm going to offer it up and mark round it and trim it. We've, we've said, and we're putting it against the, the cutout round the rack, and then we know it's down here that we need to trim the material off. So we're marking it with this marker, and we're going to trim it off like that. So with it marked like that, we get the gill bows, and we just whiz it, whiz that piece off round there. Don't, when you're cutting with these metal cutting shears, it does leave a sharp edge that you could easily cut yourself on. With the plasma cut edge, that's okay, ne you're never going to do anything with that, but that is a horrible sharp edge, just be careful. So we put it back on again now like that, and we're going to, we can see that it, it's clear there. I'm going to put a couple of screws in that corner to hold that, then I'm going to planish that corner over. Got two screws in that, one just there, one just there. We're just going to planish that corner up. Then we're going to hope that the bonnet, or the, the, the nose cone of the bonnet, will come down and miss that. And all this will shoot up into the inside of the nose cone. Obviously, we will need to swap that screw for a pop rivet later on, because it's pretty sure that that will be in the way. So we're taking out this temporary stay and we're just carefully putting the bonnet down like so and that's going over that nicely and that screw is a flipping nuisance, it's just caught it and that's going into there really really well. So what happens now is that we get the marker, the black marker, which is just here, excuse me, and we make sure the bonnet's down there and we're drawing around that like so because we know that is the um, minimum we can have and we whiz it back up again we whiz it back up in the air like that and we put the temporary stay back in again careful these temporary stays because if you're not careful you'll poke a hole in your fiberglass and what we're going to do now is that we're going to so this is nice and neat we're now going to trim a little bit off this so we know where the black line is we're going to trim it so there's about an inch like that shoots inside the nose cone like so so we might just do it slightly no no we'll do it like we said so we'll trim all that off there take it off trim that off and put it back on again Right. We've now got it on like that and um, we've trimmed it. Now, my clever technician has just explained to me that we've perhaps cut that a little bit too short. We'll have a job to get screws in there, but there is just enough room to get some self-tapping screws in there or some pot rivets, sorry. Um, but obviously, if it had been another half an inch long, it would have been better. But we've come to the next stage now. Um, you remember how to fasten all this back. Well, we, we won't do that quite yet, but we'll shut the nose cone again. Because what we need to do is tuck that behind the nose cone line. And we need to, before we fasten that, we need to push that out like so. So that it's a nice tight fit to the nose cone. So what will happen is we'll fasten that back there and instead of putting those screws or pot rivets straight in to the tube, we'll push that out and pack that out with some spacers, with some washers, um, with anything you like, so that that nose cone panel is coming out to the side of the nose cone, so there's not much of a gap there. 
So that's what we'll do. We won't do it on video, but that's something I'll do myself and I'll show you the finished product later on. We're now going to fit three panels that you get into your kit, which are the firewall panels. These separate the engine from the um, occupants. These panels, when you get them, come in this form like that. There's a large one, and then there's um, that goes in front of the passenger. There's a smaller one with a circular hole in it with the bottom cut out. That is a, that goes um, behind the servo mounting panel, and then there's one. It's not quite square with a couple of bytes out of it. That is a battery tray. You can see we're, we're marking on there exactly a foot. So we're along there, 12 inches. We're talking imperial today. 12 inches just there. And then we've got a bend backward, which is 7 inches. In actual fact, I need to do this because the genius we've got that does the program for these, he's got little bites. So if you look very carefully, you see a little bite in the panel, and that indicates where the bend goes. So um, that is there, and obviously if you project down there, you'll see that meets up with that um, cut at the bottom. So we've got one bend at 90 degrees there, and then another one going the opposite way like that. And that um, then forms that panel. If we could just come behind it, if we go behind it, we'll see that this part just there actually goes straight down. That goes straight down there and we'll just see two tail tapping screws that go into the tube. Now remember when we talk about fastening these panels in you'll notice that all the while I'm, I'm encouraging you not to weld them to fasten them in with self tapping screws. You will find the self tapping screws will work perfectly when you, thread, when you screw into this two mil tube. They do bite nicely and they do um, hold very firmly and they can be left in permanently. However, in areas where you're, you're fastening the 7mm to 7mm, then you'll find that whilst the self tapping screw is ideal initially for the uh, fixture, that eventually you'll have to uh, put pop rivets in. You mean 0.7? What did I say? 7mm. Right. Go back. Right, I didn't mean 0.7 instead of 7mm. So, we... Right, come around here again then. Resting this panel the Z-shaped panel now, and naturally you'll see that the bite that there is in it goes round that tube nicely. Don't worry if there's a little bit of a gap like that, you'll soon fill that with a silicone sealer. And then now you're coming to do the battery tray, that the battery sits in, and with that, again, there's little bites in it, you'll see little marks. You'll fold that up along that edge like there, and fold it along the back like that. Both those will be turned up, and then you'll see that Offer it up in position, and you'll see that you'll then need to approximately along there put another fold so that sits down into the in between the round tube and the back wall. And then we've just turned that face, tap that over with a hammer so it follows the contour of that tube. And then obviously, at the side, it overlaps the side panel, and then you can fasten it with screws along there. So you'll see that there is a hole just there for the clutch cable. And this other hole jack, what's this, for the accelerator, accelerator cable, cable, for the yeah. accelerator cable to go through. So that is bent, you'll see at an angle, quite a precise angle, and with your um, master cylinder and servo bolted to that, it will give you the right, correct height to um, clear the bonnet. Um, we're looking at this panel. Again, I can see there's conveniently a couple of little nicks in it, there and there, that you bend that at 90 degrees backwards, and then it looks like there's one tag there that you bend inwards and that will sit on top of the tube. This is obviously fastened quite firmly to the, just move that away, to that little 3 mil plate that's welded on top of the tube there. So when you come to bolt that on, you come to bolt the servo panel onto it and it fastens on quite securely. And then the whole lot is all sandwiched together like so. Um, it's all sandwiched together and bolted in tightly. Remember that um, you have got a little bit of movement with this panel, depending on whether you've got long or short legs, so before you decide on that where you want it, 
just decide on the length of your legs sit in the car and then you will have to just slightly reform that panel, the, one, the last panel, so that it fits correctly.